What's up guys? It's yo boy on the sensei. Welcome to what if Hashirama had a grandson with wood release. Part 2. Like share and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. The three great villages allied army was rushing at the Yuzushio island with their top speed. They saw the Uzumaki clan members near the shore and were prepared to take them on. Around that moment, they saw a young boy with black hair and emerald green eyes looking at them with a brutal expression on his face. He had a clone standing next to him. To many of the shinobi present here, his face was unfamiliar. Beside him, they saw a red-headed young girl who was an Uzumaki clan member. They were inclined to ignore these two when suddenly, a dense reddish-colored aura appeared on the redhead's body, and she seemed to have been swallowed by that massive and dense chakra. They understood that she was a Jinchuriki. Although it confused them as according to their information, Yuzushio had no Jinchuriki, they still continued to charge forwards. If the Yuzushio had its own Jinchuriki, then Kumo also had its own. Blue Bee, the eight-tailed Jinchuriki of Kumo split off from the main army and rushed towards Kushina's position with his tailed beast mode. Similar to how it was for Kushina, a dense reddish-colored aura erupted from his body, and two tails appeared behind his back. Since Kushina's tailed beast mode only had a single tail, he believed that two tails would be enough. The Rakage noticed that Blue Bee was going off to deal with the enemy Jinchuriki and was satisfied. He was leading the army from the front and would need to confront Uzumaki Hishin. Around that moment, the entire battlefield went silent when they heard the words. Would release, deep forest emergence. Blue Bee, who was charging at Araki and Kushina's position saw a sea of trees charging at them. How many were these? Tens? No, maybe hundreds of trees charging at him with great speed. They couldn't help but let out collectively, oh. Shit. Some even wanted to return to their homes. They didn't join this war against Yuzushio to face this. For some seconds, Blue Bee stopped as he couldn't believe what he saw. Why so? This was the legendary Mokutan which could easily restrain the chakra of a tailed beast. Even though he was so far away, he could feel a terrifying aura from this wood. Not only the retraining effect from Mokutan, but also an intimidating chakra which directly suppressed his eight-tailed chakra. Even the tailed beast inside of him opened his eyes as he sensed this chakra and the wood release jutsu. He spoke out in surprise, Kyubi? Mokutan? What? The poor octopus was resting in his seal. He couldn't really have a chance of escaping unless his Jinchuriki used six tails. And the situation seemed far from that scene, so he was pretty much chilling in the seal. Yet, he was abruptly woken up when he felt the restraining effect from Mokutan and Kyubi's chakra. The whole army of the three great shinobi seemed to have paused for several seconds as they noticed the wood release attack. Moreover, it was the signature attack of Senju Hashirama. By the time Blue Bee recovered from the shock, the hundreds of trees were far too close to his body. He cut apart two or three trees and jumped away before looking at Araki's direction with a hint of dread in his eyes. Meanwhile, the Rakage, Tsuchikage, and the Mizukage recovered from their shock and gazed at Araki. They immediately understood that this was the Senju clan descendant who has inherited Senju Hashirama's legendary Mokutan. Moreover, the Jinchuriki next to him was probably the Kyubi's Jinchuriki. At this moment, a thought flashed in their minds, we have been betrayed by Kanoha. To them, these two Kanoha shinobi here meant that the Kanoha had decided to protect Yuzushio. The Kanoha was probably trying to deal massive damage to Yuzushio and the three great villages. Anyway, although Bluebee had dodged the incoming trees, the shinobi behind him weren't so fortunate. Hundreds of trees seemed to hit the half of the entire Kumo army at once and cleared them away from the battlefield. It divided the first half of the Kumo army from the other half. These trees were seemingly sweeping off half of Kumo's army. Bluebee didn't need to turn to understand what had occurred. He felt that this was probably the real aim of the child in front of him. Fortunately, 
He felt that even if many of the Kumo shinobi were swept away from the battlefield, they regained their footing before moving forward to dodge these trees. Araki had a faint smirk on his face as he whispered something which drifted in the wind. Bluebee's eyes widened as he realized that something was wrong. He turned around to warn the Kumo army by shouting, Get away! Confused at why Bluebee was shouting this, the Kumo shinobi didn't respond for a few seconds. That was a bad decision on their part. The trees closest to their bodies immediately detonated. The explosion of one tree would have taken out only a small area. But the same wasn't valid for hundreds of trees exploding at the same time. The explosion covered a massive area and took out nearly 1,000 of shinobi with the blast radius. Rakage looked dumbfounded when he saw a thousand of his shinobi dying before the battle even began. He was growing furious just at this thought. Meanwhile, the other two Kage were even more startled. They never expected this to occur. To them, even if someone did inherit Senju Hashirama's Mokutan, it was just a small child. He shouldn't pose a threat to them, right? However, they realized this was just wishful thinking on their part. Fortunately, it was just Kumo who paid a dear price by underestimating this child. The Rakage was confused about what he should do now. Should he go forward and fight against Uzumaki Hishin or return to protect his shinobi from any more large-scale attacks? But, was Araki going to give him the time or opportunity to think? No way. He turned towards Kushina and asked her, Can you take on one more attack? Even though Kushina felt that she couldn't, she still nodded her head, yes. Araki could feel that she was lying to him and was going beyond her limits to help him out. He was incredibly touched by Kushina's determination to help him. He sent even more of his chakra in her body to suppress the Kyuubi's chakra in her chakra coils and absorb it so that Kushina won't feel pain. And just as he was about to tell her to pull out more chakra, Kushina heard a voice in her head, let me take over, brat. Why? You cannot control my chakra at your current power or state. Let me take over, I will help you out this one time. Kushina remained silent for only a few seconds before she decisively said to Kurama, you heard Araki, and I will use the seal Mido-sama placed as a backup. Yeah, yeah. I get it, brat. Kurama didn't seem to care about her threat. Araki was a little surprised when the aura he felt from Kushina became even denser. Even he wouldn't be able to take on such dense chakra in his body. He started feeling pain but didn't complain at this moment. Kurama had now taken over Kushina's body for some time. He spoke to Araki, kid, let go of my hand for now. You should recover your own chakra a little. I will handle the situation now. Araki was a little surprised when he heard Kurama's voice, but he still didn't back down. He knew that if he let up right now, Kushina's body would be injured even more by Kurama's chakra. Knowing that this kid won't let go, Kurama stopped urging him. A dark colored ball started forming near his mouth. The purple colored chakra condensing near Kurama's mouth was mixed in a ratio of 8 to 2 of positive black chakra to negative white chakra. Tailed Beast Bomb. If the wood release, deep forest emergence shocked the three great villages. This next attack that Kurama was creating made them shiver in fright. Especially the shinobi from Kumo. They would be the first ones to take on this attack. They had a faint feeling that this attack wouldn't kill any less than the first attack. This time, Rakage ultimately decided that he must change directions. He shouted out loudly, everyone, charge at the Jinchuriki. The Uzumaki clan members had also been dumbfounded to see the explosion occur. They also heard the Rakage's loud voice and immediately moved towards Araki and Kushina. They planned to protect the two of them from the Kumo's attack. This time, they weren't going to wait for the attack. Some battalion commanders of Kumo ordered their respective subordinates to charge up an attack. Lightning release, multiple arrow jutsu. Each of the hundreds of Kumo shinobi created ten or so lightning arrow which charged at Araki and Kurama with blinding speed. The wood clone immediately raised his hand and used a single hand seal. Wood release, tree wall barrier. Kurama's chakra was utilized by the wood clone to raise one hundreds of trees and create a wall which protected them from the lightning arrows. After Kurama was ready, Araki lowered the wood wall, and Kurama shouted with a ruthless glint in his eyes, Tailed Beast Bomb. Immediately, the Tailed Beast Bomb was released from his mouth and shot at the Kumo's shinobi forces. Bluebee was in his four-tailed mode right now. 
He immediately jumped up and took on that tailed beast bomb with his body to protect the Kumo Shinobi behind him. The Kumo Shinobi let out a breath of relief as they saw Bluebee shielding them from the tailed beast bomb. As the tailed beast bomb exploded, Bluebee took the whole explosion by his four-tailed mode. However, he realized sometime later that he shouldn't have done that. Even his four-tailed mode wasn't enough to protect him from the QB's tailed beast bomb. Half of his four-tailed mode stripped away from his body, and he let out a painful groan. He fell on the sea with some injuries on the right side of his body. The Kumo Shinobi though couldn't stay relieved for very long. Why? Because this was not the end but the start. Kurama had a bloodthirsty grin on his face as he said, it looks like I have become slower. I need to charge up for so long for such a weak-tailed beast bomb. Hmm. How about the other jutsu? Although a little weaker than this one. It should work splendidly in this situation. Araki had no idea what sort of jutsu Kurama was talking about, but he wanted him to hurry. The Kumo shinobis were quite near to them. Tailed beast bomb barrage. Kurama used his immense chakra to immediately create a tailed beast bomb and release it. He created around 30 small tailed beast bombs at a rapid rate. Around this moment, the IWA Shinobi stepped forward and spoke, Earth Release, Earth Wall Jutsu. The Kiri Shinobi also stepped forward and protected the Kumo Shinobi, Water Release, Water Wall Jutsu. The tailed beast bombs were slowed by these walls, but they couldn't stop them. Just as these tailed beast bombs smashed the walls, they exploded after coming in contact with IWA, Kumo, and Kiri Shinobi. Nearly 10,000 shinobi died after they were bombarded by multiple tailed beast bombs. Absolute destruction. This was what anyone would say after looking at this scene. After having used this move, Kurama said to Araki, this is the most this girl can handle. Any more of my chakra and her internal organs will burst apart. Alright, thank you, Kurama. I won't forget this. Humph. You better not. With that, Kurama returned to his seal, and his chakra had seemingly disappeared from Kushina's body. Araki still had enough chakra from Kyubi to perform one last jutsu. And that was? Wood release, multiple wood dragon jutsu. Tens of wood dragons were created. One of them was created right under the feet of Araki, his wood clone, and Kushina. It carried them away while the other wood dragons continued to move around them in strange formations. Araki's complexion was slowly turning ugly as he found that the wood dragons were far harder to control than he initially imagined. It took a considerable amount of his concentration just to raise their head. However, he had Kurama's chakra to use. Even though he wouldn't usually be able to control these wood dragons with his chakra, he was wasting a lot of Kurama's chakra just to control it. It also let him know that just the water walking exercise is not enough. He needs to enhance his chakra control even further to make sure he doesn't waste chakra and boosts his concentration. Anyway, he should be safe for now. Well, these were his thoughts until he saw a man clad in bluish lightning charging at him with the quickest speed possible. So, that's the rakage, huh? He stared at the rakage who was approaching him while covered in his lightning armor. The one who ordered my father's death. So, that's him. He halted the wood dragons and turned his head towards the third rakage. The rakage noticed the senju boy staring at him with cold killing intent. The killing intent he had gained from killing a thousand of Kumo soldiers was already condensing on his body. However, this didn't bother him one bit. He had a single target, right now, to pierce the senju kid's body and kill him here. Suddenly, he was forced to stop and raise his arm to block a sword slash. It was strong enough to even hurt his invincible body boosted with lightning armor. This was none other than Uzumaki Hishin who had arrived to protect Araki and Kushina. He had a resolute look in his eyes while staring at the third rakage. The third rakage asks him with a cold humph, are you really trying to overpower me in pure strength? This is beyond foolish. Foolish? I don't know about that. For a decade, there hasn't been anyone in Yuzushio who could be my match, whether it is my skill or power. Today, I need to rely on you to figure out where my limits lie. Uzumaki Hishin had a calm gaze in his eyes while speaking to Rakage. His body seemed to contain surprising strength as he could contend against the third Rakage. All the people who said those words are corpses now. The third Rakage, however, wasn't amused by this talk. He used more of his physical strength to push away Uzumaki Hishin. Yet, it seemed to have been for naught as Uzumaki Hishin didn't budge. 
I see now, you are using the seals to boost the physical strength in your arms. You are just a sham. This is my skill. Talk when you can overpower me, Rakage. Uzumaki Hishin stared at the Rakage with a calm and collected gaze. The sword in his hand moved, this time he tried to stab three different spots of the Rakage's body. However, Rakage's thunder armor didn't grant him a very high defense, but it did greatly enhance his speed. Rakage quickly blocked those stabs and shouted, Lightning release, Lariat. He decided to come close to Uzumaki Hishin and used his signature technique. He was planning on hitting Uzumaki Hishin's chest with his full strength. Even if Uzumaki Hishin had boosted his physical strength by his seals, there was no way his physique could take on this attack from the Rakage. At the least, Uzumaki Hishin's chest would be crushed. Naturally, Uzumaki Hishin was aware that taking on this attack wouldn't be wise. He raised his right hand and said, Kai. Suddenly, his body vanished, and a log appeared in front of Rakage. The Rakage Slariot hits the log and breaks it into pieces. After having destroyed the log, he frowns. This was an empty field? Just how could the body replacement jutsu work when there was no log nearby? He had no idea that this log was pulled out of a seal on Uzumaki Hishin's body. However, that wasn't all, there was something the Rakage failed to notice. And that was the explosive tag on the log. Suddenly, an explosion occurred very close to the Rakage's body which although didn't injure him, it did force him to back away by several steps. Just when the Rakage was looking around to see where Uzumaki Hishin was, he sensed a faint danger to his life and jumped back. It was fortunate that he jumped back or else, he would have been slashed by the wind-enhanced blade of Uzumaki Hishin. Perhaps even his lightning armor could have been pierced by that slash. However, Uzumaki Hishin didn't let up for a single second even though his surprise attack had been dodged. With the same intensity and ferocity as before, he attacked the third Rakage. The third Rakage didn't even have the time to use any jutsu as he was on the defensive and had to dodge multiple sword attacks from Uzumaki Hishin. The wind enhancing his sword was so sharp that the third Rakage was sure that if he tried to grab hold of that sword without his lightning chakra, his hand would be slashed. And if it was the third Rakage's body which would be slashed merely upon contact with Uzumaki Hishin's sword, there was no doubt that any other ninja would be cut up by Uzumaki Hishin. To think you had concealed such strength from us. I guess our decision to destroy you had been correct. If you continued to grow, you could have become the sixth great village. Uzumaki Hishin's facial complexion still remained calm as he heard the third Rakage's word. He continued to attack the third Rakage with the Uzumaki Kenjutsu style. The Uzumaki Kenjutsu style didn't focus on absolute attack or absolute defense. It was the ever-changing style which would switch from offense to defense after a single move. It was used to disrupt the rhythm of the opponent and confuse them. The opponent would be confused when he must attack and when he must defend. After fighting for some time, when the opponent wants to attack, he would feel as if he would be falling into a trap. And when he was defending, he would want to attack. However, to lead the rhythm, great skill was required. Moreover, Uzumaki Hishin was leading the rhythm against the third Rakage, also dubbed as the greatest Rakage. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Uzumaki Hishin was the most skilled man who could take on the third Rakage one-on-one -on -one and have a chance of winning. Whether it was his knowledge of seals or his sword skill, it was among the top. All the 1000 Uzumaki clan members behind him were all fighting against the Kumo Shinobi. Although they were all doing their best, they were losing the battle because of their low numbers. Araki continued to stare at the battlefield while he and Kushina were seated on top of the wood dragon's head. Nine wood dragons were roaming in the sky as if they were real dragons. A grave look on his face as he noticed the Kiri and IWA had caught up. Once they joined the forces of Kumo Shinobi, it would only be a matter of time before the Uzumaki clan members lost. He raised his hand and commanded eight wood dragons to attack. Two of these wood dragons were charging at the Kumo Shinobi who were already fighting against Uzumaki clan members. Three wood dragons charged at the IWA Shinobi, and three wood dragons charged at the Kiri Shinobi. A bead of sweat rolled from Araki's face as he was finding it troubling to control the wood dragon with such great distance between them. That was why he controlled the wood dragon on which he was seated on and another wood dragon to slowly approach the main battlefield. His eight wood dragons were proving to be more than a handful for the three great shinobi forces. 
Each of these three great village had lost one hundreds of shinobi to these eight wood dragons in a matter of minutes. However, fortunately for them, they managed to restrain these wood dragons now. The IWA shinobi created earth from their chakra to restrain the three wood dragons. The Kiri used water to cut apart the tail and to some extent retrain the three wood dragons, and the Kumo shinobis used brute strength and their quick speed with lightning chakra to destroy the body of the three wood dragons. Only the heads remained for some reason. The heads of these wood dragons were rather durable. A ruthless smirk appeared on Araki's face as he let out a relieved sigh, explode. Only after some time did the three great village forces understood that the purpose of the wood dragon wasn't to destroy their numbers by crushing them. It was to gather them around it? And suddenly, without any warning, the heads of the wood dragon exploded loudly. It caught the attention of the three kages who frowned upon seeing the scene. Each of these wood dragons had taken out nearly 300 or so shinobi of respective villages. It didn't please them to see many of their shinobi die against these wood dragons. That is why the third Suchikage and the third Mizukage closed the distance to these two wood dragons flying in the sky. The third Suchikage was flying in the sky while the third Mizukage looked as if he was surfing on water. They were both rushing at Araki's location with their full speed. Seeing them coming at him, a small frown appeared on Araki's face. He decided to turn the wood dragon's head and return to the island. It wouldn't be safe to remain here anymore. However, the wood dragon's flying speed was far too slow as compared to the third Suchikage and the third Mizukage. Araki's eyes moved from the third Suchikage to the third Mizukage. He noticed that the third Mizukage couldn't fly on his own. His vision fell upon the third Suchikage and thought, if this man falls, I could lose them. However, it was wishful thinking on his part to be able to damage Akage. Kushina cautiously looked at the third Suchikage but couldn't do anything right now. She felt a lot of pain in her body because of having used more of Kurama's chakra than her body could handle. Araki used his thought to control the only wood dragon remaining other than the one he and Kushina were seated. The wood dragon neared the third Suchikage and was about to explode. However, Anoki simply snorted upon seeing this. It would have given me some trouble if it was Senju Hashirama who utilized this move, but you, you are still too green to be using this move, boy. He raised his hand and joined them. Dust release, atomic dismantling jutsu. A small white colored cube was released from his hands which suddenly expanded as the wood dragon came into its range. A white light flashed around which temporarily blinded everyone who stared at this scene. It was only moments later that they could once again see. And when the vision returned to their eyes, they couldn't see the wood dragon at all. It had been pulverized to dust. Araki cursed himself under his breath. That was a bad move on his part. He didn't think that the Tsuchikage would be able to pulverize his wood dragon so effortlessly. He should have used it against the Mizukage. However, there was nothing he could do at this moment. He got ready to do his best to stop the Tsuchikage. He still had a bit of chakra left in his body. Araki. Kushina called out to him, but Araki didn't respond. He continued to gaze at the incoming third Tsuchikage with a grave look. Water release, finger bullets. Araki pointed his index finger at the third Tsuchikage and started to shoot water bullets from his finger. The third Tsuchikage frowned as he dodged the incoming water bullet by elevating. However, he realized that it wasn't just one water bullet, multiple bullets were approaching him. Araki kept on taking aim, trying his best to anticipate where the third Tsuchikage would go from his movements. Although no water bullet hit the Tsuchikage, it did slow him down. This was enough for Araki. He wasn't arrogant enough to believe that this attack would hit the Tsuchikage. However, while he was trying to hit the Tsuchikage, he failed to notice that the Mizukage was much ahead of what Araki initially thought, the Mizukage had raised the water beneath himself to equal Araki's current altitude. By the time Araki noticed him, it was too late. The Mizukage had already prepared the hand seal as he shouted, Water release, rising water slicer. Araki didn't hesitate in sending the wood clone towards this linear wave of water which was charging at him. The wood clone made quick hand seals and immediately used, Water release, water wall jutsu. Immediately, a wall of water was raised in front of Araki and Kushina which protected them from the water slicer jutsu which was sharp enough to cut apart rocks. The Mizukage went through a series of hand seals before using another jutsu. Water release, snake's mouth jutsu. 
The Mizukage used the water from the water wall raised by Iraqi's wood clone. A snake was formed of the water and immediately attacked Iraqi's wood clone. Iraqi's wood clone turned into wood upon being attacked by this water snake. The water wall soon fell, and the Mizukage frowned when he couldn't see Iraqi and Kushina on the wood dragon. He looked around, and his eyes widened slightly when he saw them freely falling on the ground. With not even the time to back away, he saw the eyes of the wood dragon lightening up before it exploded. The Mizukage managed to cover himself in water to protect himself, but he still couldn't stop the full impact of the explosion. He was still slightly hurt. Araki and Kushina soon landed on the water. Araki was tightly holding onto Kushina's body while they stood on water. However, they didn't have any time to breathe as Anoki suddenly appeared above them and used multiple hand seals and said, Earth release, fist rock technique. His arm was encased in rock, and he approached Araki, seemingly ready to kill Araki in this one blow. Araki knew he couldn't dodge this move. If he moved, Kushina would be hit. Since there was no way he could dodge, the only way left was to move forward and take on that attack. Would release, multiple would spear Jutsu. This was only Jutsu he could use which could threaten the third Suchikage, but it turned out to be for naught. The third Suchikage destroyed the wood spears with his fist which had been encased in rock. A few cracks did appear on the rock covered his hand, but it didn't reduce its power one bit. Just as Araki was about to give up, he felt a strong wind current. Before he could question what that was, he heard a loud sound which resounded in his ears multiple times. It was the sound of the metal clashing against the rock. Fortunately, I wasn't late. It was none other than Uzumaki Takuya who arrived to save Araki. It wasn't just Uzumaki Takuya, almost all the Uzumaki clan members had arrived at the shore. Previously, the Uzumaki clan members next to Uzumaki Hishin were those who could fight against the Shinobi army. The clan members who weren't strong hadn't stepped forward to join these people. However, now that their Uzumaki clan was on the verge of destruction, they had stepped forward to at least go out fighting. Uzumaki Takuya boosted his strength with Chakra to push back the third Suchikage before glancing at Araki and Kushina from the corner of his eyes, Go. We have made preparations for you to run away, now go. Araki wasn't stupid enough to hesitate at this moment. He knew that without Kurama giving him a lot of his chakra, he wasn't strong enough to interfere in such battles. It was a better choice to take Kushina and run away. The Mizukage had recovered from his shock and was about to chase after Araki that another Uzumaki clan member appeared and kept him occupied. There were naturally many Jounin and Chunins who noticed Araki and Kushina running towards the shore. They knew that their casualties occurred because of these two, if they killed them, they would receive bountiful rewards from their Kage. Several shinobis with the lightning affinity were the fastest. They covered the distance rather quickly. Araki and Kushina knew that if they continued to run like this, they would be caught. After running for some more time, they stopped. They stood on the water and faced each other. Just as the other shinobis caught up with them, Kushina rotated her chakra as best as she could and shouted, Kai. Immediately, Tens of whirlpools formed and created a seemingly blocked the way for the shinobis to chase after Araki and Kushina. Many of the shinobis were caught up in the whirlpool's flow, and they were thrown far away. Although these whirlpools didn't kill anyone, they were successful in halting the enemy. Araki and Kushina soon reached the shore. There, they met Uzumaki Haimo, the old lady who had initially come to Kanoha with Kushina. She had a grave look on her face and handed them a kunai with some seals inscribed on it, both of you, hold it tightly. Araki and Kushina obeyed her word and held the kunai tightly. Uzumaki Haimo concentrated for some seconds and then used her chakra to activate the seal on the kunai. As the seal activated, Araki and Kushina vanished into thin air. They had vanished from Yuzushio. Moreover, in place of Araki and Kushina appeared a log. It was like, it had substituted with Araki and Kushina. A middle-aged woman stared at Uzumaki Haimo and said, It was a good thing that Mito-sama taught us the second Hokage's flying Raijin Jutsu, right? Although it isn't complete, we can send them far away after some concentration and need to use something large as a replacement. Yes. Mito-sama's vision extends farther than what we can think of. Uzumaki Haimo raised her head and stared at the enemies. With that, the whole Uzumaki clan started fighting against the three great villages with all their vigor and power. 
At the end of the day, the Uzumaki clan disappeared from the face of the elemental nations. The land was razed to the ground so even if any Uzumaki clan members had survived, they wouldn't find anything at this land. The Kages of the three great villages had a frown on their faces. They never expected to have 26,000 casualties out of 40,000 shinobi in this expedition. Even though they have destroyed Kanoha's greatest ally in this war, their losses far outweigh their gains. Currently, not a single village out of Kumo, Kiri, and IWA would dare to declare war before building up their strength for seven to eight years. Fortunately, they had signed a 10-year peace agreement with Kanoha to tell them the way to enter Yuzushio. Initially, they believed they were far too generous with Kanoha by promising them peace for 10 long years. However, it seemed that this peace agreement would become their own shield which would protect them from Kanoha's fangs. They knew the personality of the Hokage, he won't declare an all-out war. The most he would do was send some of his shinobi for small skirmishes at the border. With that, the remaining forces of the three great village returned to their respective villages. All these shinobi were relatively distressed. Why so? Because even though they had destroyed Yuzushio, they had lost far more shinobi than they expected. Moreover, they remembered that it was Senju clan inheritor and the Kyubis Jinchuriki who had killed a lot of their shinobi. Many of their friends and family were lost because of their explosive attacks. Currently, they all hated Araki and Kushina more than anything. And this resentment would only grow in the future. Other than hate, they also dreaded him in their hearts. It was because they noticed that he was just a small boy right now. It made them question. Just what would happen once he grows into a teenager? What would happen once he grows up into an adult? They shuddered at the very thought. Many of the shinobi there now felt that the rumors about how Senju Hashirama and Uchiha Madara's fights could change the maps were no exaggeration. Right now, they felt like they experienced it firsthand just how powerful a Mokutan user could be. Of course, they didn't forget about Kushina. They remembered her continuous tailed beast bombs. They could understand that she was a Jinchuriki of the QB, the strongest Bijiu. However, they could have never expected her to have such control over her bijou at such a young age. She had managed to defeat Blue Bee effortlessly. Well, these shinobi were somewhat incorrect in their thoughts. It wasn't Kushina who had mastered Kurama's chakra. It was Kurama himself who was controlling her body at that time. These shinobi didn't have any idea that Kurama had already been befriended by Senju Araki and wouldn't harm Kushina. These worries were shared by their kages as well. Moreover, their kages were also dissatisfied by Kanoha's stance. On one side Kanoha had handed them the information on how to get past Yuzushio seals. On the other hand, Kanoha's bijou, the Kyubi and the Senju clan member had appeared in Yuzushio to assist the Uzumaki clan. Did they seek dual destruction of both forces? For now, they decided not to confront Kanoha about this matter. With this event, the second shinobi war had officially ended. At the same time, Araki and Kushina opened their eyes and were astonished to see they were surrounded by thousands of redheads in a forest. It was a forest near the land of waves. It took Araki and Kushina nearly an hour to understand the situation and what had transpired. The Uzumaki clan members who had arrived at the end to confront the three great village forces were in reality clones. They were known as blood clones. These blood clones were much more different than a typical clone mainly because of two reasons. The blood clones needed the blood of the user and the user's vitality and was embedded in the clone using a seal. This meant that the life force of the ones who used the blood clone would be halved. And the second was, the blood clones wouldn't disappear immediately after being hit. They would continue to exist until the blood inside of the body is extinguished. And unlike the shadow clones or wood clones, these clones aren't connected to the consciousness of the user. Meaning, once these clones disperse, the user won't get any memories. However, it seemed that Uzumaki Hishin and the thousands of the Uzumaki clan members capable of fighting who were behind him were indeed dead. The reason they hadn't created blood clones was that their faces were known in the world. At least among the Kages of the great villages, their faces were known. They didn't want to take the risk of showing off their faces in the world again. Because once their faces were known, the elemental nations would become aware that Uzumaki clan members still lived. At that time, the Uzumaki clan members would be hunted by these three great nations elite shinobis. Another reason was because of their own pride. 
These 1,000 or so Uzumaki clan shinobi didn't wish to keep living in the world while hiding the proud name of the Uzumaki clan. They hid this reason from the other members of the clan because they didn't wish for them to stay and get killed. Besides, Uzumaki Hishin and Uzumaki Takuya had utter faith in their heads that as long as Araki and Kushina continued to live, they could help these Uzumaki clan members to revive the Uzumaki clan once again. Araki had a grim look on his face as he remembered his conversation with Uzumaki Hishin nearly half a month ago. At that time, Uzumaki Hishin had told him that he would be leaving everything in Araki's hands. Araki didn't understand him at that moment. No. Maybe he did, but he was just fooling himself. Did uncle feel responsible that the destruction of the Uzumaki clan was going to occur while he was the clan head? That he couldn't protect the clan? Or maybe his decision to trust Konoha? He shook these thoughts from his head, no point in thinking about this right now. Right now, I need to keep the whole clan united. As long as the Uzumaki clan remains hidden for a few years, it should have a safe future ahead. Moreover, I need to gather enough power so that when I announce the Uzumaki clan's presence to the whole world, there will be no one who would dare to attack us. Unconsciously, Araki had accepted his Uzumaki identity as well. He then called out for the Uzumaki clan members, the middle-aged members. Well, they were the oldest members of the Uzumaki clan now since the elders, and many of the strong Uzumaki clan members had died. Most of the Uzumaki clan members who survived were all children. Anyway, he had set a meeting with the oldest surviving members of the Uzumaki clan since their children would naturally listen to their parents. It's nice to meet you all. I am really happy that you all decided to use the blood clone to survive. These were his honest thoughts. Most of these middle-aged members of the Uzumaki family were women. Probably because unlike their husbands, they had seemingly stopped training to better take care of their family. Their husbands had died in the war against the three great shinobi forces while they had to use blood clones to survive and live for their children, at least. All the ones seated on wooden chairs in front of Araki knew who this child was. They had seen him for one whole month and interacted with him. They did not respect him because he had the bloodline limit of Mokutan like his grandfather Senju Hashirama. They respected him and even adored him because he was the grandson of Uzumaki Mito. Which meant he was one of their own. Greetings, Araki-sama. All these people respectfully greeted him. This respectful greeting caught him by surprise, and he curiously asked them, Why are you so respectful to me? Clan head ordered us to listen to Araki-sama's instructions once we survive the Yuzushio's destruction. He said that although you are young in terms of age, you hold the potential to become a leader. Even Lord Takuya had nothing but respect for you. It seemed that these Uzumaki clan members had been given clear instructions. This was something Araki did know. However, he didn't think the Uzumaki clan members would earnestly obey his instructions. The sincere looks on their faces were the things which caught him off guard. However, he decided not to think about it for this moment. Very well, I don't know what Uncle Hishin was expecting, but I will do my best to keep the Uzumaki clan protected. With this out of the way, he addressed another issue, the entire elemental nations believe that the Uzumaki clan has been destroyed. That is why my first instruction will be to ask you to change your name. At least until we are strong enough to declare the proud name of Uzumaki clan once again in the world. The faces of the Uzumaki clan members darkened. They didn't like this decision, but they understood that this was for their own benefits. Araki wasn't finished speaking, he continued, not only that, but all of you also need to use some seal to change the color of your hair. Maybe brown or black, your choice about that. I am sure you are skilled enough to accomplish that. Yes. They said in a feeble voice but suggested that they didn't like this idea. I do not like this idea any more than you do. However, it's required. Araki said with a resolute tone. Alright. What name shall we adopt? If we take over a single name and appear in the land of waves, people are bound to get suspicious. This was a rather good question. If thousands of people with the same family name arrived in the land of waves right after Yuzushio's destruction, people would start talking and spreading rumors. The news would eventually reach the Kage's ears as well. And that wouldn't be good. Araki then thought about it for some time before answering, I think Samazaki will be an appropriate family name. As for the other issue, you won't all live in the land of waves. Only 100 or so will live here for now. 
The rest of you will be coming to the land of fire. All of you will split up in the different towns around Kanoha, taking your family with you. After every month, I will be going to different villages to pull over the Uzumaki clan members into the Senju clan manor. I am sure the Hokage won't deny me if I tell him that I request for people to maintain the Senju clan manor. Moreover, I will reveal my sensing ability to him so that I can use the excuse that I will only recruit people with good potential as a shinobi. All of you hold chakra which is far beyond a normal shinobi, I am sure it will be enough to fool the Hokage. This would take a long time for Arakisama to bring all the Uzumaki clan members to the Senju clan manor. After all, we have nearly 2,000 or so people here. Moreover, even Arakisama would have trouble taking care of all 2,000 of us in the Senju clan manor while hiding our Uzumaki lineage. One of the middle-aged men asked a good question. Araki nodded his head and responded, You are right. I would only be able to pull over 200 or so Uzumaki clan members into the Senju clan manor. After choosing 200 or so Uzumaki clan members, I will be sending the rest towards the land of waves. By that time, there will be Uzumaki clan members here who could help out the others members of the Uzumaki clan to set up. Each one of the Uzumaki clan member present at this moment was pretty much dumbfounded. They now understood why their clan head had ordered them to listen to Araki-sama's instructions. One by one, all of them kneeled in front of him. Araki had a blank look on his face before he slowly shook his head. Looks like I will need to hold the reins for some time. A slash N, for all those who are curious why Araki would return to Kanoha. I guess I can list you a few points since I didn't mention it in the chapter. Firstly, the Senju clan property, it was in Kanoha and had quite a wealth. Secondly, if the wood release user and Kyuubi's Jinchuriki would stay away from Kanoha, do you think Kanoha would remain quiet? They would search for them down to the hell and force them to return. And once they are found, the Uzumaki clan would be at Kanoha's mercy. Araki walked towards Kushina and noticed that some of the Uzumaki clan members were healing her injuries. He had a bitter smile on his face because he knew that these injuries were all because of him. If not for his plan to make Kushina use Kurama's chakra to fight against the three great village forces, she wouldn't be in such a sorry state. However, when he had heard that the Yuzushio would be attacked by the three great villages, he couldn't remain quiet. The Rakage had taken his father away from him on suspicion. They had a similar reason to attack Yuzushio, just because the three great villages thought they could become a threat. Araki felt like he must respond. Even if it shows off his prowess and makes them cautious against himself, he felt that he must still respond. He must show them he wouldn't just sit if they kept on doing as they pleased. Moreover, his determination to destroy the entire Kumo village had reached new heights. Since these three great villages like to destroy other villages because of a small suspicion, he would give them the same medicine. Not just give them this medicine, he would shove it down their throat and make sure they choke on it. The killing intent on Araki's body was condensing rapidly. He realized the more he thought about these three great villages, his hatred for them also continued to increase. He clenched his fist so tightly that his nails dug deep into his hand. Blood leaked out of these small wounds, but he didn't care. Staring at the fallen figure of Kushina, Araki muttered slowly, Get well soon, Kushina-chan. With that, he moved towards another location. This time, he had a sword in his hand. There stood ten or so wood clones in front of him, holding identical swords in their hands as well. One of these wood clone asked Araki with a grave voice, You sure, boss? Araki rolled his eyes at the question and responded, You are me. You should know how serious I am. With that, the wood clones charged at Araki. Araki alone fought against ten of his wood clones while they surrounded him and attacked him at his weak points. Even though his wood clones were somewhat weaker than himself, Ten were strong enough to pose a challenge to him. Moreover, when they surrounded him, it became even more dangerous for him. Even though he had narrowly dodged attacks on his vital points tens of times in his fight against his wood clones, Araki still didn't feel any terror. He remembered that feeling when the third Suchikage was about to punch him with fist rock technique. Although he was prepared to die to protect Kushina, he dreaded that fist immensely. It was because he knew that he wouldn't stand a chance at all. If not for the arrival of Uzumaki Takuya, Araki's Kenjutsu teacher, he would have died there and become a corpse. For the whole night, Araki continued to train with his wood clones. After he defeated them all, 
he would once again create ten more wood clones and fight them without any rest. By the dawn, Araki's body was filled with cuts all over his body. Moreover, he was huffing crazily as he stared at the one remaining wood clone in front of him. He lost a lot of blood and just feel unconscious in the middle of the fight. The wood clone dispersed immediately after Araki fell unconscious. It was fortunate that he healed rapidly, or else there would be severe consequences. The next day, Kushina also woke up. Her injuries were more or less cured now. It could be attributed to the Uzumaki clan members who had healed her initially and Kurama's chakra dealing with any hidden injuries left. She heard a sound in her head, you are finally awake, brat. It seems my chakra was much more than your body could handle. Kushina wasn't startled to hear his voice. In the one month, Araki had stayed at Uzumaki Island, he had informed her that the fox wasn't bad. At least, he wouldn't hurt her until Araki died. She trusted Araki's judgment on this and had decided to treat Kurama a little warmly as compared to before. What is it, Fox? You never speak to me on your own accord. Well, even though she knew Kurama's name, she still called him, Fox. It was shorter for her. Kurama wasn't really bothered by this since he was a fox. Couldn't really take that as an insult. He said with a cold humph, yeah, I got better things to do than talk with a brat like you. Yeah, I am sure it's fun to look at the barren land, Kushina said in a sarcastic tone which irritated Kurama a little. Definitely more fun than talking to you, brat. Kurama wasn't going to let up, and Kushina was about to retort when Kurama continued, the other brat's hatred has reached another level. Go and meet him. You don't need to tell me that, Kushina replied before cutting off the mental link with Kurama. Kushina went to the location where Araki had been training. Well, some of the Uzumaki clan members knew about it, so they led her to the location. Fortunately, by the time she arrived, Araki's minor injuries were healed, and it seemed as if he was just sleeping there. She sat next to him while gazing at Araki's face and caressed his rough yet beautiful black hair. He looked so innocent and good while sleeping that Kushina didn't even realize she had been staring at Araki's face for 10 minutes or so. Well, even though Kushina didn't realize the passage of time while staring at Araki's face, the bijou inside of her felt as if time was moving incredibly slowly. Kurama let out a sigh and wondering why did it have to stare at Araki's face for 10 or more minutes. Was his host going mad or couldn't she look anywhere? He wanted to see sights other than the stupid face of a child. Even if the said child was Araki. Araki continued to sleep for an hour before he opened his eyes. He was surprised to see Kushina's face just as he opened his eyes. He wondered where he was and then looked around. He started recalling the events of the previous day. kushina John, sorry, I didn't realize you had come. I was just so tired that I slept for so long. Um, don't worry. She shook her head negatively that she didn't mind it. She saw him rubbing his eyes and clear them away before turning to her. It looks like you are completely healed. He gave her a kind smile before adding, also, really thanks Kurama. I really appreciate it that you lend us your power. See that you remember the favor, kid. He said to Kushina, who passed it to Araki. Araki let out a chuckle and said, definitely. It was Kushina who asked him, so, what should we do next? Araki gave her a smile and said, after a few days, we will return to Kanoha. And there, we have to with the third Hokage. How will we deal with the third Hokage? Kushina asked with a relatively worried look. Although she didn't understand matters related to politics, she did know that it would be hard to deal with the third Hokage, also dubbed as, the professor. Don't worry, I do have a plan to deal with him. He gave her a reassuring smile while calculating inside his head on how the third Hokage must be dealt with. After three to four days of informing the Uzumaki clan members of the plan from Araki, Kushina and Araki were on their way to return to Kanoha. Araki was quite a lot faster than Kushina, but he ran at an equal pace so Kushina wouldn't be left behind. While they were running, he turned to Kushina and said, I am sorry. I am sorry that I couldn't save Uncle Hishin. He really didn't know what else to say to Kushina. To this, Kushina remained quiet for some moments before replying to him, my father made his own choice. The same for all the other Uzumaki clan members who died with him. He knew his presence would have been troublesome for Uzumaki clan's future. I am proud of him for his decision to not hesitate in sacrificing himself for the clan. 
Even though she said these words, she couldn't hide the bitter feelings in her heart from Araki. However, he knew that no matter what he said to her right now, it wouldn't lessen her pain. It was better to give her time to accept it. By the end of the day, they returned to Kanoha. The Chunin guards at the entrance had been ordered by the third Hokage to immediately bring Senju Araki and Uzumaki Kushina to him once they are spotted. Actually, this was an order which had been given to almost all the shinobi. But, these Chunin guards were the first ones to spot the two of them. These Chunin guards were happy when they spotted Araki and Kushina. They hoped that they would be given some hefty reward for this. When Araki and Kushina approached the entrance gates, these two Chunin guards stepped forward. They said collectively in a domineering tone, the Hokage has ordered you two to appear before him immediately. Alright, take us to him. Araki readily agreed since he wished to deal with the Hokage first as well. It was better to have a Facito face meeting than to be sneakily attacked. The two Chunin were surprised when they saw Araki readily agreeing. They faced each other, wondering why the two had agreed so quickly. Shouldn't they have resisted a little? But still, they decided not to think about this for the moment and took them straight to the Hokage's office. Many other shinobi saw Araki and Kushina walking with the two Chunins. They had received the same mission as these Chunin guards and muttered under their breaths, lucky guards. Meanwhile, the Chunin guards were looking forward to a hefty sum of Rio. Their salary from the guard duty wasn't enough to fulfill their dreams. After they entered the Hokage's office, the Hokage was a little startled to see the two Chunin guards followed by Araki and Kushina. The two had grave looks on their faces as they followed these Chunin guards. You both can leave. I will ask the secretory to reward you for the completion of the mission. These words from the third Hokage lit up their faces. After the two Chunins left the office, the third Hokage had a stern look on his face as he stared at Araki and Kushina. Where were you two? Why couldn't I find you in the village? The third Hokage's stern look demanded the truth out of Araki. Araki decided to be the one to speak here, I have a better question for you, third Hokage. Yuzushio was attacked by the allied army of the three great village of Kiri, Kumo, and IWA. Why did Kanoha not send any reinforcements? You aren't in any position to ask me any questions. Give answers to my questions, first, Senju Araki. The third Hokage had the same look as before, no, his gaze was stricter as compared to before. You should know the answers to those questions. I am still curious why the Kanoha wouldn't send a single shinobi to assist Yuzushio. Do you have any answer? He stared at the Hokage with a merciless look in his eyes. Perhaps the Hokage felt compelled by these eyes to answer his question and replied, Kanoha had just dealt with the Suna village's forces. We can't make an enemy out of three great villages. Oh, really? And yet, you have enough shinobi who were seemingly waiting for us near the Kanoha's entrance gate. Tell them they can't escape from my senses no matter how well they hide. Araki casually stated it to the third Hokage who narrowed his eyes. He guessed it must have been Danzo's root shinobi. Besides, we both know that it's a big fat lie about how you don't have enough shinobi to help out Yuzushio. It's just that you felt they weren't worth the trouble, right monkey? Araki sneered at the third Hokage. He didn't wait for the third Hokage to reply before continuing, with allies like Kanoha, there is no need for enemies. That is all I have to say. With that, Araki turned around and was walking out of the Hokage's office. Stop! We are still not finished yet. The Hokage called out for Araki who merely glared at him from the corner of his eyes. I do believe we are done here, monkey. And don't forget, from today, I am the Senju clan head. Even you cannot use your powers as a Hokage to order me around now. Araki declared himself as the Senju clan head. Needless to say, the third Hokage wasn't pleased with this declaration. Firstly, he was even a little mad at Araki when he heard this boy call him, monkey. It gave him a feeling as if he was standing in front of that detestable woman, Uzumaki Mito again. He was a lot better at controlling his emotions and didn't show it on his face. He calmly said to Araki, you aren't the eldest Senju clan member. It's Senju Tsunade, one of the three great Sanin. If anything, she is more qualified to be the head of the Senju clan. This is Senju clan's matter, and an outsider's opinion is as useful as your help to Yuzushio. If my elder cousin does have an issue with me becoming the head of the Senju clan, then she can contact me. I don't need any advice from you, monkey. 
This was the last statement he needed to say before he left the office. Kushina was about to follow him when suddenly, she heard the Hokage call out to her, Uzumaki Kushina, remain in the room, we need to have a talk as well. Araki didn't stop the third Hokage. He figured it would be better for Kushina to have this talk with the Hokage. The Hokage stared at Kushina for some moments, seemingly thinking of how he should tackle the situation. He gave her a kind smile before saying, don't mind Araki's words. I assure you that there was nothing Kanoha could do to assist Yuzushio. I just wanted to ask you to not go along with Araki from now on. He could place you into grave danger. You carry a great burden? A burden that could endanger your life and lives close to you. I am sure you are aware of it. Currently, Kushina was unconsciously using the negative emotion skill granted to her by Kurama. The Hokage was giving her such a bad feeling that she couldn't tolerate being in the same room as him. Burden? Fuck you. Who are you calling a burden? I can still beat your ugly ass any day of the week. Kurama seemed to be raging at the third Hokage at being called a burden. Kushina wanted to laugh after hearing Kurama cursing the third Hokage in her head. Your life is very precious to the whole Kanoha. Make sure to protect yourself and Araki. If he does pull you into doing something, inform me about it first. The third Hokage didn't realize that all his words were for naught. No. These words were making Kushina even more cautious of the Hokage. Kushina just nodded her head before she quickly left the office. She couldn't tolerate the sight of the Hokage anymore. She felt that if she remained in front of him anymore, she would be unable to stop herself from shouting at him. As she left the office, she saw that Araki hadn't moved far away from the office, he seemed to be staring at a middle-aged man with a bandage covering his one eye. Araki was staring at this one-eyed man with a strong intensity while the man in front of him returned the stare with equal intensity. So, you are Shimura Danzo, huh? Both Araki and Danzo kept observing each other. Danzo had an emotionless look on his face which made it exceedingly hard for Araki to guess what he was thinking. You are the inheritor to Mokutan, huh? It didn't seem like a question from Danzo, but he said that anyway. Araki narrowed his eyes. For some reason, Araki felt that Danzo stared at him as if he was staring at a piece of tool. Araki intensely disliked this feeling. He was about to respond when Kushina approached them. Danzo turned his gaze from Araki to Kushina before speaking, the QB, huh? I didn't expect to meet you at the same time. Araki's pupils narrowed at this statement from Danzo. And I didn't want to meet with a one-eyed cyclops like you, Kushina said with some annoyance in her eyes. She had just met that hypocritical Hokage, and now she was meeting someone even worse. Just great. Meanwhile, Kurama inside of her mind shouted at Danzo meet me? Come here, and fucking meet me. I will show you who the great Kyubisama is. It's such a pity that a great being like me was compared to this brat. Kushina's brows twitched upon hearing Kurama's last line. It felt like she had been insulted by the QB. Get out of my way, Araki said while staring at Danzo, who was seemingly blocking their way. Danzo continued to stare at Araki while saying, there is so much untapped potential in both of you. Train under me, and you will become the strongest in the world. Araki snorted at his words and replied, go and become stronger than the Hokage before giving out empty promises. I don't need a one-eyed cyclops help to become the strongest. Danzo didn't seem to care about the insults hurled at him. He turned towards Kushina and said, I can make you utilize the full power of Kyubi. You will be a great weapon of Kanoha once you master that power. Your assistance is not needed, Shimura Danzo. Araki coldly replied to Danzo's words. If you don't accept my training, you will find yourself under attack every day until you do accept my training. I do control Kanoha's A and B U after all. Danzo gave out a subtle threat while they were still standing in the hallway. Contrary to what he believed, Araki smiled, since you are so kind as to give us a warning, let me respond in kind. While I live in Kanoha, if there is an assassination attempt on me or on any Senju clan member, and I have even a slight suspicion that it was because of you or the Hokage, I wouldn't think any more and just unleash the QB in Kanoha. Go and have him all to yourself then. I promise I won't lift a finger to help either side. Araki gave his own warning to Danzo before taking hold of Kushina's hand and walking away. This time, Danzo didn't dare to stop them. He could sense that this boy was speaking the truth, he wouldn't bat an eye before unleashing the QB upon Kanoha. 
It seemed that he just needed a puny reason, and he would erupt in anger. The first one to face his rage would naturally be Kanoha. This is all that woman's fault. If only I had taken this boy under my command a year ago, this situation wouldn't have occurred. But that woman. Danzo seemed to be cursing Uzumaki Mito for her interference a year ago. While they were returning to Senju clan manor, Kushina asked Araki, why did you speak like that to Hokage or Danzo? Maybe we should have hidden our discontentment. Araki shook his head at the question and replied, if we had shown a slight weakness, they would have controlled us and forced us to dance in the palm of their hands. Especially that monkey. That is why we needed to show them that we are utterly disappointed with Kanoha so that they won't dare to take any action which would aggravate the situation even further. The Hokage would probably start thinking of schemes to make us loyal to Kanoha. While Danzo would be looking for an opportunity when I am separated from you and attack me. As long as he holds me captive, he could make use of you. Araki said to Kushina with a smile. Kushina had spirals in her eyes as she didn't understand all this. Araki continued speaking, our trump card is that they don't know that Kurama is our ally. Moreover, once they hear the information that I used Mokutan, and you used Kurama's power to kill tens of thousands of shinobi of the three great villages, it ought to restrain the Hokage and this Danzo guy even further. They will understand that we aren't completely helpless against them. With that, Araki finished speaking. He had more or less dealt with the Hokage and Danzo with this move. Now, as long as he remained cautious against them, there shouldn't be an issue in protecting himself and Kushina. However, staying protected wasn't his main objective. His main objective was the destruction of the three great villages? For that, the forces under him were far from enough. He needed more allies. And he knew the first one he must recruit? For now, he and Kushina returned to the Senju clan manor. For the next two months, all these two did was continue to train. Kushina started training her own water jutsus with the shadow clones. While Araki created 50 or so wood clones. 10 of them worked on water jutsu, 20 on wood jutsu, and 20 on another chakra control exercise. It was the kunai balancing technique. The difficulty of this exercise was entirely on another level as compared to any other chakra control exercise. Meanwhile, Araki created another 10 wood clones before fighting against them with all his might. Every day, they would be dead tired and would sleep as soon as their bodies fell on the bed. However, Araki was still unsatisfied with his progress. His chakra control had significantly improved, his chakra was much larger as compared to before. Yet, the progress was too slow. Especially regarding his sword skill. He lets out a sigh and decides that training like this wouldn't be that effective anymore. However, a question appeared in his mind, should I return to the academy or not? After thinking for some time, he shook his head. The academy wouldn't be able to train him. The people there, other than Namike's Minato didn't seem to have the potential to even keep up with him. Is it time to contact that clan? He mused in his head, wondering if he should do it now or not. Finally making up his mind, he said, all right, I guess I will contact them. He didn't inform Kushina about this and started heading towards this clan. He was walking towards the Uchiha compound. The Uchiha compound was near the outskirts of Kanoha. And there, just next to it was the prison which held all the prisoners. As far as Araki remembered, the Uchiha clan had been given the Kanoha military police force to enforce justice in Kanoha. He remembered his grandmother had informed him that this was just his granduncle Toborama's way of isolating the Uchihas. It was to prevent them from having any sort of power related to the governance of Kanoha. Giving them this Kanoha military police force, they had given them power on the surface but limited their actions. The Uchiha clan members held bitter hatred for Toborama because of this. There was a chance they wouldn't listen to him because of this. But, Araki still continued to walk forwards. Some of the Uchihas noticed Araki entering the Uchiha district. They immediately stopped him and said to him coldly, Who are you? What is your reason for entering the Uchiha clan district? I am Senju Araki. I want to meet the Uchiha clan head. Upon hearing that he was from the Senju clan, the Uchihas narrowed their eyes and stared at Araki. They couldn't believe someone from the Senju clan would dare to come here. You truly have some nerve coming to here, Senju boy. One of the Uchihas spoke while his eyes changed color from black to crimson red color with two tomo revolving in his eyes. Araki looked into his eyes without any fear. 
The Achiha who was using his two Tomo Sharingan snorted at this and used Jinjutsu. It was a Jinjutsu in which the opponent would feel as if they were thrown into a sea of fire. However, contrary to his belief, Araki's expression never changed. He was naturally experiencing the Jinjutsu. However, he experienced no pain in the sea of flames. Araki gently shook his head and said to the Uchiha, next time, use a better Jinjutsu. This is far too weak. Just as he finished speaking, the Jinjutsu shattered. Araki's chakra was strong enough to pressurize all these Uchiha clan members. He gently said, I haven't come to fight here. I sincerely wish to meet the Uchiha clan head to improve the relations between the Senju clan and the Uchiha clan. The Uchiha clan members recovered from their shock after Araki withdrew his chakra. He continued to stare at them as if forcing them to make a choice. Noticing that the Uchiha clan members were still puzzled, Araki asked them, Is the Uchiha clan so weak that they can't even let a child like me enter the clan compound? Just as he imagined, the faces of the Uchiha clan members changed immediately. They stared at Araki and grunted before speaking, HNN. Who is scared of you? Kumi Said. We can't guarantee that the clan head would meet you though. Unlike a carefree child, he is a busy man. I thank you, Araki said before following them inside the Uchiha district. There were many houses in the Uchiha clan district. Araki and three Uchihas in front of him continued to walk for some time before they finally reached their destination. It was the house of the Uchiha clan head. The three Uchiha in front of Araki first entered the house to inform the clan head that Araki wanted to meet him. After what seemed like ten or so minutes, Araki was finally called inside the house. He was made to sit in the guest room where the current head of the Uchiha clan, Uchiha Kazuma soon joined him. The man looked to be nearly 35 or so years old. He had an aura of an expert around him. It was similar to the aura Araki sensed around Uzumaki Hishin and the Hokage. Uchiha Kazuma had a tranquil domineering aura. Even though he was aware that it was a Senju clan member who had come to see him, Araki felt no trace of hatred. Just confusion? Why have you come to meet me, Senju Araki? His voice was emotionless, just mixed with a hint of confusion. Araki took a deep breath to calm his thoughts and said, I have come to improve the relations between the Senju and the Uchiha. Improve relations? Do you even understand the graveness of the matter? Uchiha Kazuma's voice was incredibly cold as he questioned Araki. Araki nodded his head and started speaking, our clan's history dates back to the time when the villages weren't even formed. The Senju and the Uchiha, our fierce rivalry existed for hundreds of years before it was finally united by the efforts of my grandfather, Senju Hashirama and Uchiha Madara. This symbol of unification is this village of Kanoha. I don't know what happened, but Uchiha Madara left the village at some point. Even the Uchiha clan didn't support his notion of leaving the village and let him go alone. Uchiha Madara returned with QB before he was defeated by my grandfather. This is something my grandmother Mido told me. Araki stared at Uchiha Kazuma's face. Uchiha Kazuma then said, Uchiha clan might hate the Senju clan to the bones, but even we know that Senju Hashirama was a man of his words. During the time of his reign, the Uchihas were treated equally or perhaps even better than the Senju clan. That is why the clan decided not to follow Uchiha Madara and remained with Konoha. However, everything changed when Senju Toborama became the Hokage. Uchiha Kazuma's face darkened when he spoke about Senju Toborama. Araki didn't interrupt him and let him continue speaking, after Senju Toborama became the Hokage, he started limiting our influence in the governance. Not just that, he handed us the Konoha military police force so that we can enforce justice. We accepted it, thinking that this could be another sign of trust between the Senju and Uchiha. But we were far too naive. He constructed a prison next to the department of Konoha military police force. Since then, people have started avoiding the Uchiha as a plague. Our reputation has slowly degraded to this point that Shinobi wouldn't serve us. They no longer hold any respect for Uchiha. Uchiha Kazuma finished speaking with a grave voice. Araki nods his head and says, I won't lie and say this wasn't the fault of my granduncle Toborama. He was paranoid against the Uchiha and released policies against you. I do agree that he has been very unfair to you. He then raised his head and looked into Uchiha Kazuma's eyes, however, this is the sole reason I have come here. I wish to repair our relations. 
What can you offer the Uchiha? There are no Senju clan survivors other than you and Senju Tsunade. Other than your wealth, do you have anything left? Uchiha Kazuma looked at Araki and asked with a domineering tone. Araki wasn't intimidated by this tone and merely smiled in return, the Senju clan has the respect of the people. My grandfather and granduncle were the first and second Hokage of Konoha. And I will become the clan head of the Senju clan. As the head of the Senju clan, I have enough say over who becomes the next Hokage. I can recommend a candidate from the Uchiha clan. Why would you do that? Don't you want to become Hokage? Uchiha Kazuma showed off a confused look. Araki simply shook his head negatively, I hold no ambition in leading Konoha. Being the head of the Senju clan is enough for me. Ho! Oh, this is an interesting proposal. But, I believe the clan elders wouldn't trust your word for it. Uchiha Kazuma says while staring at Araki. Araki frowns at those words. He knew Uchiha Kazuma was just using the name of clan elders. In fact, he also didn't trust Araki's word, as well. Araki was a little helpless when he faced this issue and asked Uchiha Kazuma straight away, how can I make you trust me? Currently, you can't. Trust is built over time. However, I wouldn't say that this alliance has no future. Uchiha Kazuma said, giving a hint of hope to Araki. Araki's eyes widened a little before he showed a grateful look, alright. I will show my sincerity towards the Uchiha with time. Now, let's talk about the other reason I am here. The reason why I am asking for the Uchiha clan's cooperation is for you to give me information about the things occurring in the elemental nations and maybe sometimes let me spar some of Uchiha clan members. We won't give away the information for free. We will charge you according to the value of the information. And as for the matter of sparring, each Uchiha clan member will be eager to prove his superiority over you. Uchiha Kazuma had a hit of a smile. Maybe he could use Araki as a sharpening tool for the young Uchiha clan members. Araki knew that Uchiha Kazuma planned to use him, but this was in an acceptable range. He could accept it. It wasn't like he wouldn't benefit from this. After the conversation with Uchiha Kazuma, Araki immediately left. He was going towards the Senju clan manor. Uchiha Kazuma turned towards the window and says, It looks like you have a fierce rival for yourself, Kashiro. In that corner, there was a small kid of nearly Araki's age. Just a little older than Araki, maybe. He was Uchiha Kashiro, Uchiha Kazuma's younger son. HNN. Uchiha Kashiro grunted in dissatisfaction, he didn't like how his father was thinking of Senju Araki as his rival. Did that mean his father, Uchiha Kazuma, believed that Senju Araki could pose a challenge to him? That was a preposterous thought. He can't defeat me now that I have these eyes. His eyes changed color and were now crimson red color with three tomo revolving in his eyes. You are quite talented to have awakened your Sharingan at this young age and then having achieved the three tomo level, but solely relying on Sharingan will prevent you from becoming truly strong. Uchiha Kazuma said with a grave look on his face. Anyway, you will know when you fight against Senju Araki. I am sure he will bring you down a peg or two. Uchiha Kazuma shrugged upon seeing his son's indifference. HNN. Uchiha Kashiro once again grunted in dissatisfaction. A little helpless in front of his son, Uchiha Kazuma really didn't know how to make him understand that Sharingan was an excellent tool, but it didn't make one invincible. He knew that his son wouldn't understand that unless he fought against Senju Araki. He felt that there was a chance for his son to mature if he interacts with Senju Araki. When is elder sister returning from her mission? Uchiha Kashiro asked his father in a curious voice. Uchiha Kazuma replied to him with a neutral voice, Fugaku sent me a message stating that he is going to accompany Hitaki Sukumo's return to Konoha in the next few months. It doesn't seem like Suna would be attacking Konoha anytime soon with depleted resources. He will also be bringing Mikoto with him. Uchiha Mikoto, she was 13 years old and was the eldest daughter of Uchiha Kazuma. She was a chunin ranked shinobi. A smile broke out on Kashiro's face, he was happy that his elder sister was finally free to return. Maybe he could learn some new tricks from her. He remembered she was really good at the body replacement jutsu. Around this time, Araki returned to the Senju clan manor. In these two months, he had taken over the Senju clan property entirely. Nothing much needed to be done since the paperwork had been prepared by Uzumaki Mito before her death. 
He had to sign some documents or some seals before he could legally be called the Senju clan head. And, the first thing Araki did was go to various villages around Kanoha bring the Uzumaki clan members there to the Senju clan manor. The Uzumaki clan members were patiently waiting for Araki to arrive. There were some orphans out of these surviving members of Uzumaki clan. They were initially handed some Ryo and asked to use them thoughtfully. The first ones Araki brought to the Senju clan manor were these orphans. It was because there was no adult among them, they wouldn't be able to take care of each other. Next, Araki went around and took in some more Uzumaki clan member from other villages. After having brought 40 to 50 Uzumaki clan members to the Senju clan manor, he stopped with this. Araki then focused on meeting with the other Uzumaki clan members and asked them to go to the land of waves. With this, nearly 200 or so members of the Uzumaki clan had relocated. He just needed to do it for 5 months, and all the Uzumaki clan members would be well settled. There wouldn't be any threat to their lives at least. All that Araki needed to do was keep them hidden from the Hokage and that Danzo's eyes. At the same time, in a dark cave, an easily distinguishable creature with a pure black body and golden eyes with no pupils was seen. He kneeled down in front of an old man while speaking, the Uzumaki clan was attacked by the three great villages. The old man looked amused at the information, the Uzumaki clan was attacked? What was Kanoha's stance? The Kanoha did not send any reinforcements. In fact, the student of the third Hokage, Orochimaru, sold the way to enter Yuzushio to Kumo on very high price. The third Hokage knew of this but did not make any attempts to stop him. The black creature speaks again. It shows that Shinobi will continue to seek conflict no matter how much time passes. Hashirama, was this the village you envisioned? A smile appeared on the old man's face as this was quite good for him. You mentioned that the Uzumaki clan was attacked, but didn't say that they were destroyed. Does that mean some survived? The old man asks with some hint of curiosity in his voice. Madara-sama, the Uzumaki clan was attacked, and they bitterly resisted. But, it seemed that Uzumaki Mido had made some preparations to save her clan members. They all created blood clones to fool the world. Currently, they have changed the color of their hairs with some seals and taken up their family name as Samazaki since they can't use Uzumaki name in public anymore. Their leader is a small child named Senju Araki. The black thing explained it to Madara. Senju? Madara raised his brow with a small frown. Yes. Senju Araki. He is the grandson of Senju Hashirama. Moreover, unlike Senju Tsunade, Senju Araki has also inherited the legendary Mokutan of Senju Hashirama. He has inherited Hashirama's Mokutan. A surprised look appeared on his face. This news did excite him. Yes. Senju Araki has shown off his use of many of Senju Hashirama's attacks in the battle against the three great villages. How old is he? Eight year old. The excitement in Madara's eyes died down. This disappointed him a little. If only this boy was 15 to 16, maybe this brat would have entertained him. Right now, this boy was far too weak. Black Zetsu, go and meet this boy. Ask him to come and meet me. Madara ordered the Black Zetsu. Madara-sama, although he is young, he doesn't seem to be stupid. He wouldn't follow me. Black Zetsu said to Madara with an expression that seemed to be a frown. Madara though shook his head negatively, he will follow you. Just mention that you know where the surviving Uzumaki clan members live. He would rather meet me than take the risk. Yes, Madara-sama. With that, Black Zetsu left the cave. The next day, Araki was very puzzled. Currently, Araki was seated in his room. It was inside the Senju clan manor which was surrounded by the forests in all direction. No matter who it was, Araki would sense the person approaching the Senju clan manor. Yet, when he saw a black thing seemingly standing in front of his body, he couldn't help exhibit his shock. Was he too negligent in his sensing skill? No. That shouldn't be the case. What are you? He asked cautiously, preparing to use a defensive skill in case this thing attacked. Greetings, Senju Araki. I am Black Zetsu. My master has sent me to bring you to him. The black thing opened its mouth while staring at Araki with what seemed like a grin. Araki stared at this thing for some time before asking, Who is your master? Why should I meet him? You will know once you meet him. As for why you must come, do you know, the land of waves is a perfect place. 
A good place for people to hide, I mean. You understand what I mean, right? Black Zetsu gave a nice smile with those golden eyes. Even though Araki tried hard to give no reactions, he still couldn't stop his eyes narrowing at that information. He started cursing in his head, this fucker. He knows. Trying to maintain an indifferent image outside was a lot harder than it sounded. His complexion also changed a little, and he asked Black Zetsu, how do you know? And who else knows of this? I can't answer these two questions. Tell me now, will you come with me or not? Black Zetsu asked him with a small smile. All right, I will come. But not now, I will come with you a month later. Senju Araki replies to Black Zetsu. Black Zetsu was a little stunned when he saw that Senju Araki didn't show any resistance. As for the time, he didn't know how he should approach. Madara hadn't told him anything about it. A month later? Did he want to train even more before coming? Such a naive child. Did he think he could acquire enough power to face the unknown after a month of training? After deciding internally, the Black Zetsu said, Very well. Do make sure to not inform anyone about this, especially the Kyubi Jinchuriki. My tongue could slip, as well. Alright, I won't talk about this with Kushina. Just come and bring me away after one month. For this one month, I need to assign various tasks to my new retainers. Senju Araki says a little indifferently, which makes Black Zetsu nod his head in agreement. With that, his body phases through the ground. Araki once again frowns, he couldn't sense this thing again. It was as if it wasn't a living thing but some sort of will. He didn't like that this thing could spy on him and he would never know about it. He needed to take some countermeasures. As for requesting a month wasn't just because he wanted to manage the Uzumaki clan members he had recently recruited into Senju clan. It was for one another reason? A faint smile appeared on his lips as he walked towards an Uzumaki clan member. He had to ask him about a seal? It could be useful. Just like that, a month passed away before they realized it. As usual, Araki did all the training he could in this month. For now, he hadn't gone to Uchiha clan to have his spar against the members of Uchiha clan. Well, it was mostly because Uchiha Kazuma didn't feel that the time was right. He was waiting for the perfect time to ask Araki to fight against many Uchiha youngsters. Perhaps waiting for his daughter, Uchiha Mikoto, to return. His musing was interrupted when he heard a sound behind him, come with me. Araki was startled when he turned to see Black Zetsu there. He frowned a little as even though he was wearing some special seals which enhanced his senses, he still couldn't sense him. Now, he was sure that this thing in front of him didn't have a life force. As he stared at it, he realized that this thing didn't even seem to breathe. This would be somewhat troublesome. Where are we going? Araki asked him with a curious gaze. Follow me. With that, Black Zetsu jumped out of the window and start running through the forest. Araki didn't hesitate in jumping after the Black Zetsu and following him. He kept enough distance between himself and the Black Zetsu so he could immediately back away in case there was danger. After running for what seemed like an entire day, they finally reached their destination. It was near the location where Kanoha's borders lie with IWA. Araki followed after Black Zetsu and entered a dark cave. His eyes widened in shock as he sensed something dangerous. This cave reeked of danger. The chakra he sensed right now? It was so sinister and dense that it was nothing that he had sensed before. Moreover, it made his senses forcing him to run away. Not even Kurama could accomplish that feat it was like he stood no chance against this person. Just who is he? Who is this person waiting for me? As Araki kept walking, he eventually reached the end where he saw a huge statue and many hose pipes connected to an old man who had kept his eyes closed. The man was incredibly old as his hairs were utterly white and many wrinkles on his face. Araki found it surprising as he thought, this is the old man giving me such dangerous vibes? Just who is he? So, you are Hashirama's descendant, huh? Achiha Madara speaks while carefully observing Araki through his chakra. Who are you, old man? Senju Araki asks with a straightforward tone. He wasn't going to underestimate this man who gave him such a dangerous feeling. Black Zetsu didn't mention it? Madara questioned Black Zetsu who merely shrugged his shoulders and replied, I wasn't told to mention your identity. Hmm? Very well. I am Uchiha Madara. I wonder if you have heard of me. There was a trace of a smile on the Uchiha Madara's old face. What did you just say? 
This information was far too much for Senju Araki's brain to handle. I am Achiha Madara. I wonder if you are aware of me? What did you just say? These words utterly shocked Senju Araki. He wondered whether he had heard wrongly or not. However, sometime later, he calmed down, there was no point in showing such reactions to Uchiha Madara. In fact, he needed to figure out just why he had been called here. You survived in the battle against my grandpa, huh? Araki asks while narrowing his eyes. I nearly died at that time. Even I was a little unsure of the result, but it seems to have worked out. Uchiha Madara then shook his head. He asks Araki with a neutral voice, what are your views on the current shinobi system? Shinobi system? I don't have any great views on it. I just think that shinobi cannot let people live in peace. It's like they are tortured when they see that people are peacefully living their lives. Araki replies to Madara while carefully gazing at him. Ho! Oh, looks like you don't have the same naive ideas as Hashirama. This was all I needed to know. Madara then turned to Black Zetsu before saying to him, take him away. No, wait, before you leave. A sealess wood clone of Madara appeared. How about you have a fight against me? The wood clone of Madara spoke before staring at Araki. For some time, Araki's eyes remained wide since he couldn't believe that Madara Uchiha was using wood release. After some time, he shook his head as he raised his hand, if it was any clone other than wood, I would have been helpless against it. But, since it's a wood clone, I just need to do this. The chakra released from his fingertips reached Madara's wood clone. As soon as it hits the wood clone, the wood clone's eyes widened. The chakra inside it was slowly transforming. Before he even realized it, the wood clone had turned into a huge tree. Ho! Oh, your control over the wood release is quite magnificent. I thought none other than Hashirama would be able to do that. I didn't think I would ever use this skill since I am the only one with the wood release. I guess I was wrong. How can you use wood release? I don't believe I have seen any record stating that. This is my secret. Madara had an emotionless expression while speaking this. Araki just shrugged his shoulders, so? I take it that you don't want to return to Achiha clan right now? Sneering at those words, Madara responded, I told them that if they remained in the village, they would be outcasts. That's precisely the situation now. Since they did not heed my words, I won't be returning to that clan. Araki then turned around, all right then, I will take my leave now. There isn't anything left for me to hear, right? Seeing Madara shake his head, Araki didn't hesitate in leaving. After he left, Black Zetsu looked at Madara and asks him, Madara-sama, wasn't that too risky? Showing him that you are alive and also the ghetto statue behind you. Black Zetsu, you do not understand it, do you? He is the grandson of Hashirama. Moreover, his skill over wood release doesn't seem to be any less than that of Hashirama. It's just that his age is limiting his power right now. Even if I don't like it, he will play a huge role in my future plans. I need to know his thoughts and adapt accordingly. Besides, I have not given him any idea about my plans for this shinobi world. Currently, he believes that I, Achiha Madara, wish to meet him because of his lineage. Well, he isn't wrong if he thinks that. Looks like I can look forward to something after I revive. As if deciding something, he says to Black Setsu, we will change our plans now. You will now be going to aim. Yes, Madara-sama. Also, meet that snake from Kanoha, you should know what to do with that snake. Yes, Madara-sama. Just give him a few cells of Hashirama Senju and allow him to experiment. With his personality, he will definitely experiment it on several people just to confirm his hypothesis. Well well. Senju Araki, for how long you can dance? How long can you entertain me? Madara asked this question which drifted into the wind. Senju Araki was indeed thinking about his conversation with Achiha Madara. That man? Even though he was at the end of his life, his aura still seemed very strong. He wondered what Kurama would say when he finds out that Araki met up with Achiha Madara. Maybe Kurama would want to crush Madara to pieces. However, from what he sensed, Achiha Madara's life force was nearly over. There shouldn't be something he can do about his remaining life force, right? Though he was curious about the reason why Black Zetsu roaming around and collecting intel for Achiha Madara, he thought it was probably because Madara was indeed planning something. He let out a sigh and wondered, if I had fought him there, would I have survived? 
From what it seemed like, Uchiha Madara could have controlled that giant statue to attack me. Well, even if he has some plans, he can't live any longer than 10 or so years. I should remain cautious about his plans though. He spent the whole day running towards Kanoha. Other than Kushina, nobody really found out that he wasn't in the area. It was because Araki had a history of training very hard and then sleeping at the same location. Currently, Hataki Sakumo, Achiha Makoto, Achiha Fukaku and some other high-ranking ninja were returning to Kanoha. It seems that everything at the borders had finally stabilized, and they could leave the situation to another commanding general. Achiha Mikoto remembered the contents of the letter sent by her father. He mentioned that her little brother might have to fight against someone from the Senju clan. They were waiting for her to arrive before starting the fight against that Senju clan member. A similar letter had been received by Achiha Fugaku, just that it sounded a lot more formal than Mikoto's letter. He had a look of indifference as he found out the shinobi he would be seeing the fight of an 8 years old Senju clan member. If this Senju clan member manages to defeat a lot of Uchiha clan members, there was a chance that Uchiha Kazuma would suck up his pride and let Fugaku handle the situation. This would be an excellent chance to increase his prestige within the Uchiha clan. That way, he can be the next Uchiha clan head without any issues. Meanwhile, Mikoto was a bit curious to meet this Senju clan member. From what her father had written in the letter, it seems that Senju Araki was the current head of the Senju clan. She was aware that Senju Tsunade still lived. Although she was roaming the lands, drinking and wasting her life away, she was still the eldest Senju clan member. Moreover, as one of the three Sanans, her might had been proved already. To think the next clan head of the Senju clan would be a child instead of Senju Tsunade. It made her shake her head and sigh. Just how the mighty Senju clan had fallen. It had been a few days since Araki met up with Achiha Madara. Currently, he was having a pleasant conversation with Kushina while walking towards the Achiha clan district. He didn't want to split up from her and didn't plan to hide the fact that he would be cooperating with the Achiha clan. Kushina continued to talk with him while they traveled to the Achiha clan district. Kurama wasn't pleased when he heard that they would be going to Achiha clan district. However, knowing that Araki would be beating these detestable Achihas, he had an excited expression. He planned on enjoying the show of those damned Uchihas being beaten by a mere kid. Moreover, a Senju kid. Talking like that, they soon reached the Uchiha clan district. Many Uchiha clan members saw Araki enter the district, but no one stopped him. They all held a challenging grin on their faces. It seemed that each one was excited to show what they were made of. Kurama snickered upon seeing the proud looks on the faces of these Uchiha clan members. After having walked for some time, they finally reached the place. Araki noticed a large platform on which Uchiha Kazuma was standing. He turned towards Araki and then towards Kushina before frowning a little, is this Uzumaki Kushina? Is she going to take part in this competition? Others might not be aware of the secret information, but he was well aware that Kushina was the Kyuubi's Jinchuriki. Moreover, there was a rumor spreading in the elemental nations that a young boy with Mokutan and a young Jinchuriki had heavily damaged the three great villages' forces. Upon Uchiha Kazuma's question, Araki shook his head, No. I will be the one to fight. She will just watch the fight. Very well, then. I heard from the Hokage that you are eight-year-old. There are only a few eight-year-old Uchiha kids, I wanted to ask if you would be fine with an older opponent. Uchiha Kazuma stated while staring at Araki. With an indifferent look on his face, as long as they are only a few years older than me. Very well, that's acceptable. Uchiha Kazuma stated before turning towards the Uchiha clan members. Everyone, this boy before you is Senju Araki. He has inherited the wood release of Senju Hashirama, the first Hokage of Kanoha. You have already heard the details of the deal. As long as you bring him down, you would be bringing honor to the Uchiha clan. Is there anyone who wants to step up for the pride of the Uchiha clan? Uchiha Kazuma asked the other members of the Uchiha clan. Many of the fathers then turned towards their young sons and urged them to go up and prove their power. These children naturally wanted their parents to praise them. And they also wanted to defeat a Senju clan member themselves. So, they immediately raised their hand and shouted, Me. No, me. Go. First. No, I will go first. I can beat you easily, you would just embarrass the Uchiha clan. 
I will go and defeat a Senju clan member. HRGHH, I will still go. I can definitely beat him. These reactions surprised Senju Araki. Although he knew there was a great rivalry between the Senju and Uchiha, he never expected it was so fierce. Unconsciously, he started experiencing goosebumps all over his body. Was this how it felt when his ancestors fought against the Uchihas? He couldn't help but admit that he was quite excited right now. Maybe, he was also looking forward to humiliating the Uchiha clan in a battle. As he looked around, his eyes stopped on a young boy who mysteriously smiled in his direction. He had a similar look as of other Uchihas with dark black hairs and completely black eyes. Araki didn't know why, but this boy interested him a little. Shaking his head at that thought, he turned towards Uchiha Kazuma, please send them in the order of their age. The youngest can come first while the eldest can come last. I was thinking of the same thing. Uchiha Kazuma seemed to have the same plan in his mind. Uchiha Jairu, come forward, you are nearly eight year old. You will fight against Senju Araki. Yes, clan head. The little boy named Achiha Jairu immediately replied while jumping on top of the platform. Many of the other children lowered their heads. They wanted to go first, but alas, they were a few days older than Achiha Jairu. Achiha Kazuma waited for some moments before announcing, and thus, I announce this battle to start. Achiha Shinjiro shall be the one officiating this match and the match is ahead. Yes, clan head. Uchiha Shinjiro immediately gave his consent to the decision of the Uchiha clan head. Araki gave a short bow to Uchiha Jairu before speaking, let's have a good match. He gave a smile after speaking. Uchiha Jairu replied with a grunt, HNN. The two waited for Uchiha Kazuma and Uchiha Shinjiro to get down from the platform. Uchiha Jairu immediately started making some hand seals after Uchiha Kazuma, and Uchiha Shinjiro gets down from the platform. This was the standard technique of the Uchiha clan. Fire Release, Great Fireball Jutsu The first jutsu Uchiha Jairu decides to use was the Great Fireball Jutsu. Araki was a little caught off guard at why this guy used an elemental jutsu so quick in the combat. But, he responded immediately by using one seal and saying, Water Release, Water Wall Jutsu. He controlled the moisture in the air and created a wall of water in front of his body. This level of control over water chakra did not escape Uchiha Kazuma's eyes. A smile appeared on his lips as he thought in his head, it seems that this kid doesn't just have Senju Hashirama's bloodline, he even has the control over the water like Senju Tobarama. Quite the monstrous potential. The other Uchihas were using their Sharingan to copy any techniques which were going to be used by Araki. Araki didn't wait for Uchiha Jairu to attack at this time and moved faster. Pulling out his sword from the sheath while running towards Uchiha Jairu who had pulled out a kunai before charging at Araki. Araki didn't even need to think about what he should do against such a frontal attack. He raised his sword and attacked the kunai in his hand. The kunai was hit with such force that it slipped out of Uchiha Jairu's weak grip. After the kunai slipped away from Uchiha Jairu's slip, he thrust the sword right near Uchiha Jairu's throat. Admit defeat right now or... He said while showing off his full killing intent. Uchiha Jairu showed off a frightened look, and he backed away because of that burst of killing intent. As if his interest had waned, Araki turned towards the other Uchiha clan members while pointing his sword at them, next one. This bastard. Entire Uchiha clan seemed to blow up at Senju Araki. They couldn't believe that a Senju clan would dare to utter such words with that indifferent and arrogant look. Kushina felt a little weird while she stood near the angered Uchiha clan. Meanwhile, Kurama was having a blast in her mind. He even seemed to be giving ideas of some techniques to Kushina so she could tell it to Araki. And he could use it on these Uchiha. Uchiha Kazuma smiled faintly upon seeing the scene. This was precisely what he was aiming for. In these years, he had felt that the skills of the shinobi of the Uchiha clan were slowly degrading. Now that the Senju clan had nearly reduced to nothing, the Uchiha clan members had reduced their training. It was as if the fire in their hearts had died down. Someone needed to lit up that fire again to make them break past their limits and become strong again. This was what Uchiha Kazuma wanted from Araki. He wanted Araki to lit up that flame in their hearts. After having lit up a flame in the hearts of Uchiha clan members, Araki waited for his next contestant. It was someone by the name of Uchiha Genryu. 
Achiha Shinjiro stepped on the platform before announcing, Are both contestants ready? Araki and Genryu nodded in return. The battle between Senju Araki and Achiha Genryu. Start. Achiha Shinjiro used the body flicker technique to leave the platform. Unlike Achiha Juru who had started off with a fire jutsu, Achiha Genryu immediately rushed towards Araki. He seemed to be intent in fighting against Araki in close combat. Araki sighed at his frontal attack. He didn't even think of confronting this attack. He remained standing at the same position as if waiting for Achiha Genryu to arrive. Just when Achiha Genryu was in front of him, he pulled out his kunai and planned on attacking Araki's throat. Araki casually sidestepped and dodged Genryu. Genryu stumbled a little as he wanted to change his direction immediately. Upon seeing the opportunity, Araki stepped forwards and gave him a strong kick on his gut. The kick was so strong that Genryu felt as if his innards had rearranged a little. He held his stomach and fell on the ground, coughing up a mixture of blood and saliva. Araki stared at Genryu and said, was that all? How pitiful. Currently, the Uchiha clan felt like this was not an insult from Araki to Genryu. It was an insult from Araki to the whole Uchiha clan. If Uchiha Jiru's defeat raised their fighting spirit, this defeat angered them thoroughly. The small flame in their hearts had now been raised to an all-destroying fire. Even Araki was confused at his own words. He didn't plan on saying such words to Uchiha Genryu. However, he also couldn't hide his disappointment when he noticed that the Uchiha clan members were much weaker than his expectation. The smile on Uchiha Kazuma's face widened slightly. He knew that the situation was dire as the Uchiha clan members were getting riled up far too much. Yet, he felt that this was also good. He needed to see a sort of madness in them when they do start training. However, he also realized that the next one who he sends must not be weak. Or all this fighting spirit gained by the Uchiha clan members would start turning into the direction of hopelessness. He turned towards a particular direction and spoke out, the next one who will participate will be, Uchiha Yuden. Go forward and fight. Yes, clan head, he will immediately go. Uchiha Yuten's father replied for him to Uchiha Kazuma before asking his son to go up on the stage. Uchiha Yuten had a grim expression while staring at Araki. Although he was angered by Araki's earlier words, he had seen that Araki did have some ability. It wouldn't be a good idea to underestimate him. Achiha Yuten closed his eyes for some time before reopening them with crimson eyes and two tomos revolving in them. Araki was a little surprised and guessed that Achiha Kazuma probably sent him to retrieve some prestige back for the Achiha clan. It was also the first time Araki would be fighting against the Sharingan. He couldn't help but feel that he was delighted. Meanwhile, inside of Kushina's head, she heard a loud growl from Kurama as he shouted, that Sharingan. Kill that guy. Poke his eyes. Those fucking eyes. She really found his voice disturbing and cut off their mental connection for some time. Achiha Yuten pulled out two kunai. He stepped forward while cautiously gazing at Araki's face. Even though he was coming closer, he seemed to have no intention of attacking. Araki was a little curious about what this guy was doing. Did Yuten want him to make the first move? He internally shrugged and decided to be the first one to charge. Yuten cautiously stared at Araki very cautiously and immediately moved once Araki was in his range. He easily dodged Araki's thrust and a diagonal slash following it. It was like Yuten could see what moves he was going to do next. Yuten immediately stepped forward and slashed Araki's arm. Before he could come closer, Araki raised the arm with which he was holding his sword. Even though Yuten could see this attack with his Sharingan, he realized that he couldn't damage Araki's chest now. If he moved any closer, he would be slashed by that sword. Thus, he improvised at that moment and slashed Araki's hand with which Araki was holding his sword. This sudden movement from Yuten did catch him by surprise. This was the perfect response to his attack. He immediately backed away upon realizing that it would be dangerous to continue fighting in close combat against him. Well, he could use the complicated moves of Uzumaki Kenjutsu style, but he didn't want to give away techniques to the spying eyes of the Uchiha clan. The Uchiha clan members who had awakened their Sharingan were staring at him in the hopes of copying his fighting style or techniques. After having backed away and created a bit of distance, the Uchiha clan members standing around the platform saw it as their first win against Senju Araki. 
To have forced Senju Araki to back away was already good enough. Great, Yuten. Now go and defeat him. His father gave his command. However, Achiha Yuten didn't move. It seemed that he was still keen on letting Senju Araki move first rather than attack. You are simply countering my moves after foreseeing them with your Sharingan. I admit, these are quite the powerful eyes you have there. But, I know the weakness of your eyes. What? Although surprised, Achiha Yuten did not lose his cool. Once again, Araki rushed at Achiha Yuten, this time, he was even faster than before. Achiha Yuten snorted in his mind. Did Araki think he could go fast enough at a speed at which Achiha Yuten wouldn't be able to avoid his attack? He parried Araki's slash and rushed forward to attack him when suddenly, he noticed the smile on Araki's face widening. It was at that moment, Achiha Yuten noticed. A wood clone behind his own body, the kunai held by the wood clone was placed against the back of Achiha Yuten's throat. The fight had come to an end with this move from Araki. The entire Achiha clan remained stunned for a moment before they lowered their heads in disappointment. Just when they felt Achiha Yuten could redeem the clan, he had to lose in such an anticlimactic manner. Perhaps they were too hopeful. However, they were curious about who will fight next. Mikoto Achiha was standing near her father's side. She looked ready to step on the platform to defeat Araki. Knowing what his daughter was thinking, Achiha Kazuma placed a hand over her shoulder while telling her, remain calm. I have another fighter for him. Kashiro, you are up now. Achiha Kazuma says to his younger son. HNN, it's finally my turn, huh? Achiha Kashiro though said with an emotionless voice, he couldn't hide the smile on his face. Achiha Mikoto was a little worried about her younger brother fighting against Senju Araki. Would he be okay? Don't worry about your brother. Just see the match? Alright, father. A slash N, I guess I need to clarify something to all of you. Firstly, the great fireball jutsu, according to canon, Itachi learned that jutsu near 5 years of age and mastered it in a single try. Hell, even Sasuke mastered it before 7 years of age considering that Achiha massacre occurred when he was or at most 8. The Achiha kids here are all 8 years or higher than 8 years old. If they can't even know of the great fireball jutsu at 8 years of age then I really am speechless at their weakness. Secondly, Itachi and Shursue managed to awaken their Sharingan early which was considered rather amazing because it was the time of peace. However, at this time, the second shinobi war has just ended. Can't the kids have awakened the Sharingan earlier? People seem to look down on Abido because he couldn't awaken his Sharingan even at the age of 12. Doesn't that mean it is awakened significantly earlier? I have simply kept the facts in my mind. The fourth match was between Senju Araki and Uchiha Kashiro. Both seemed to be similar in terms of age. Actually, Achiha Kashiro seemed to be a little older than Senju Araki. Possibly by a few months. Anyway, the two seemed to observe each other somewhat cautiously. It was Achiha Kashiro who moved first. He was holding his own sword, although it was a little short compared to Araki's sword. Araki took his stance as well and prepared to counter Achiha Kashiro. Just when Achiha Kashiro was within one arm distance, he moved his sword so fast that an average shinobi wouldn't be able to see it. Achiha Kashiro raised his short sword to immediately deflected this sword slash which was going for his head. Senju Araki was a little surprised by his reaction speed, but he didn't stop at that moment. He used his other hand to punch Achiha Kashiro's gut. From the range, Achiha Kashiro's short sword wouldn't be able to reach him. And just when he was becoming assured that his hit would connect, his eyes widened a little when he noticed Achiha Kashiro's fist holding his punch. As Achiha Kashiro stopped Araki's punch, he felt a slight tremor in his body. The punch was far too powerful. He shuddered a little at the thought if that hit had connected with his body. Araki used his entire strength in his right arm and brought down the sword at a rapid speed. It was so fast that Achiha Kashiro barely had any time to respond. However, just before it slashed Achiha Kashiro's chest, Araki felt as if his body had stopped. Achiha Kashiro spoke out at that moment, lightning release, quick paralyze. Araki really felt that his body was paralyzed. He couldn't move at all. And hearing the name of the technique from Achiha Kashiro, it meant that he had used this technique without performing hand seals. Such control over lightning chakra was indeed surprising. Now, this is over. 
Just as that thought entered Uchiha Kashiro's mind, the ground beneath him ruptured. Another Araki appeared and punched Uchiha Kashiro away. After Uchiha Kashiro was thrown away, he stood next to Araki who had also started moving. It seems that the quick paralyzed Jutsu would only work for a short period. That was pretty good. He honestly admitted while looking at Uchiha Kashiro. In turn, Uchiha Kashiro simply grunted. He didn't think this guy would perform a sealess would clone in that situation. It seemed he couldn't be defeated that quickly after all. Uchiha Kashiro sheathed his sword and started making quick hand seals. His speed was so fast that Araki was barely able to keep up with his eyes. Lightning release, lightning hound. A hound of lightning was formed, and it attacked Senju Araki. Araki didn't move at all. Instead, his wood clone did. His wood clone moved a bit ahead and used, earth release, earth wall jutsu. The wood clone raised a wall of earth in front of Araki. The lightning hound crashed against the wall and dispersed. Just when Uchiha Kashiro was about to move, he suddenly felt a kunai blade hitting his back. His eyes narrowed slightly as he understood what happened. He noticed that Senju Araki was right behind himself and a hole near his position. However, he didn't despair at this moment. In fact, it was Senju Araki whose eyes widened when he felt his kunai passing through Uchiha Kashiro. He felt a strong bolt of lightning coursing through his body. While he was electrocuted, he thought in his head I see. That was a lightning shadow clone. Uchiha Kashiro was suddenly behind Senju Araki's body. Just as he was about to slash Araki's body, he was suddenly stabbed by two wooden spears which pierced his stomach. However, he wasn't going to go down without a fight, so he managed to stab Araki's hand while he was falling on the ground. The hand which he stabbed was the hand with which Araki held his sword. Feeling such pain, Araki couldn't help but release his grip on his sword. Araki used that opportunity to jump backwards and create some distance between himself and Uchiha Kashiro. By now, Uchiha Kashiro managed to deal with the wood spears piercing his stomach. He was losing a lot of blood, so he decided to end it quickly. He made a single hand seal and shouted, Fire release, Great Fireball Jutsu. Unlike the Great Fireball Jutsu from Uchiha Jairu, this was indeed a colossal fireball. Even though it hadn't reached his position, Araki did feel the heat from this jutsu. He used a single hand seal and shouted, Water release, Raging Waves. Araki released a considerable amount of water from his mouth, which was enough to counter the great fireball jutsu. The steam covered the whole platform. Now, the Uchiha clan members and Kushina couldn't see what was going on the platform. They merely heard some sounds which sounded as if they were running. Some sounds of metal clashing against each other. Slowly, the steam had started the disperse. On the platform, they saw Araki and Kashiro standing next to each other. Araki's kunai which he was holding with his left hand was placed against Kashiro's throat. While, Kashiro's short sword was placed against Araki's left side of the chest, directly in front of his heart. Achiha Shinjiro was a little confused at what he should do. Should he stop the match right here or let it continue? He turned towards Uchiha Kazuma who gave him a signal. This match ends as a draw. Both sides should lower their weapons now. Both Araki and Kashiro ched at this decision. It seemed like they were disappointed that this match ended as a draw. Kashiro started thinking deeply, he got lucky. If I had used my three Tomo Sharingan, he would have definitely lost. Araki was also thinking in his head, I could have ended this fight much earlier by sending 50 wood clones to fight him. So what he used Sharingan? At one point or another, he was bound to exhaust himself and lose. They didn't realize, but the two believed with utter faith in their abilities that if they had truly fought, they would have won. During the fight, the two didn't want to showcase their full ability to the opponent since they didn't find each other worthy enough. But now, the two knew that their opponent wasn't some random person. He was strong. Although they didn't say anything, the respect for their opponent did grow in their head. Just like that, this battle between the Uchiha clan youngsters and Senju Araki had come to an end. The other Uchiha clan members were somewhat satisfied with this result. To them, a draw was good enough. Moreover, many of the Uchiha clan members were going to urge their children to start training seriously. Or maybe they would personally train them from now. In the Uchiha clan district, Uchiha Kashiro was lying on his bed with some injuries on his body. The wood spears had pierced his stomach, and there were some cuts all over his arm and body. 
There was an Uchiha who had copied some healing techniques and did heal the superficial injuries on Uchiha Kashiro's body. Uchiha Kazuma entered his son's room, he had a smile on his face as he said, it seems that you are in bad shape, son. HNN, I will beat him next time. This time, I didn't even use my Sharingan, next time, I will use it and beat him. Uchiha Kashiro was in a nasty mood. Uchiha Kazuma let out a sigh before he started speaking, you have been training since you were four year old. I have personally taught you some jutsus, and you even awakened your Sharingan at the age of five. You have mastered it in the next three years, which is already very surprising. However, I have heard that this child appeared in Kanoha just a little more than a year ago. He had only been training for a little more than a year. Yet, he could achieve a draw against you. I said it, didn't I? If I used my Sharingan, I would have won. Achiha Kashiro shouted at his father. He also didn't use his would release jutsus. Moreover, because he didn't want it to be too unfair for you, he didn't use more than a single wood clone. What do you think would have happened if he used 10 wood clones or maybe 20 wood clones? Could you beat them all while also keeping an eye on him? Achiha Kazuma's questions hit the mark as they immediately made Achiha Kashiro speechless. He was indeed not confident about that. I also noticed that he wasn't using the Senju clan's taijutsu style. If he had used that, you would have some serious problems. Maybe you could have lost. As Achiha Kazuma finished speaking, he noticed that his son wasn't even looking him in his eyes. It seems that he was quite ashamed. I am not saying this because I like to praise that Senju boy. However, I have noticed that since awakening your Sharingan, you think of yourself higher than others. Perhaps it's because you think of yourself to be very talented. But do remember, there is no shortage of talented people in this world. If you don't survive, it doesn't matter jack shit if you are talented or not. Achiha Kazuma stood up as he finished lecturing his son. Humph. Alright. Achiha Kashiro let out these words with some reluctance and saw his father leave the room. After some time, another person entered his room. And when Achiha Kashiro noticed who it was, a smile appeared on his face. Elder sister. A cheerful smile appeared on his face. He was delighted to see his sister. Looks like father was admonishing you as usual. Achiha Makoto said while sitting on a chair next to her little brother's bed. Yeah. Achiha Kashiro nodded his head. Don't worry about it, father is internally very proud to have a talented child like you. He wants you to become the strongest. Mikoto said while gently patting her little brother's head. MHM, this gave a really comforting feeling for Achiha Kashiro. He moved his body a little and leaned towards his elder sister and hugged her, I missed you, elder sister. I was so scared. I didn't know if you would return from the front lines or not. Flicking at her brother's forehead, Mikoto said, it's not that easy to kill me. Even if I am not as talented as you, my skill in body replacement technique is quite good. I don't even need a log to replace myself. I can now replace myself with a smaller object as well, so don't worry about me. After thinking for some time, Mikoto said, when you are treated, let's go in the forest, and I will show you some new techniques I copied. These are some new lightning style techniques. I am sure it will be useful to you. Achiha Kashiro's eyes twinkled at the prospect of learning another new jutsu. It was Achiha Mikoto who had taught him the lightning hound technique which he had used against Araki. He immediately wanted to stand up and go to the forest to learn this technique. However, Achiha Mikoto bonked his head with a light punch, no way. You aren't going to move until your wound is healed. But, Achiha Kashiro stopped himself from speaking when he noticed his elder sister's glare. Yes, elder sister. He lowered his head in defeat. Don't worry, since I had been away for so long, I wouldn't leave you while you are recuperating from your injuries. I can tell you about how it was for me at the front lines. With that, Achiha Mikoto started to inform her younger brother about how the front lines were for her. Achiha Kazuma had a smile on his face as he peeked at his children. It gave him a strange sense of satisfaction to see his children so cheerful. Meanwhile, on the other side of Kanoha, Araki had nearly healed. His chakra's healing properties were quite good. As long as the bones weren't damaged, he would heal in two hours or a little more than that. And if his bones were fractured, he would need one whole day to heal. Currently, Araki was sitting in the hall with Kushina. Kushina asked him with a curious expression, why didn't you finish the fight earlier? 
I don't believe that you would have lost if you fight a little more seriously. And I am not talking about using more clones. You didn't even use water jutsus. To this, Araki negatively shook his head, my overall motive wasn't to defeat the Uchiha clan descendants, it was to gain battle experience and show my sincerity to the Uchiha clan. The reason Uchiha Kazuma has agreed to the alliance between us is that he wants to use me as a whetstone. I could have easily defeated Uchiha Kashiro, but that would defeat the purpose of why I even want to have an alliance with the Uchiha clan. The Uchiha clan that I want to have an alliance must be strong. At least stronger than right now. However, I also didn't want to lose to a miserable shinobi. It's a good thing that Kashiro had achieved the threshold. Kushina stared at Araki and said, Araki, what will we be doing now? Araki thought for some time before answering her, there are two paths ahead of us. One is by graduating from the academy. However, during that time, the Hokage would split us up by putting us in separate teams. The second method is to become an apprentice of a shinobi who has special rights. Are you talking about the Sanans? Kushina asked Araki with a confused look. She remembered that the Sanans were the students of the third Hokage, it would be dangerous to become their apprentice. Fortunately for her, Araki shook his head. Other than Sanans, there is one more man who has special rights. It isn't because of his lineage or because he had been trained by the third Hokage. This man became a strong shinobi all through his own effort. Not even the Sanans can be compared to him. Kanoha's white fang, Hataki Sakumo. He has recently returned from the front lines, we need to become his apprentices. If we become his apprentices, we wouldn't need to be worried about the Hokage ordering us to do some mission. We aren't shinobis under him after all, nor have we pledged our loyalty to the Hokage, so he wouldn't be able to order us without a really good excuse. Araki said with a resolute tone. The next day, Araki and Kushina walked towards the Hataki Sakumo's house. As far as Araki was aware of, Hataki Sakumo was the last surviving member of the Hataki clan. He had married a clan member of Inazuka clan. It seems that he and his wife loved each other very much. And with Hataki Sakumo's prowess in the battlefield and his power, the Inazuka clan consented to his marriage with their clan member. Araki and Kushina soon reached their house. The house was located at the western side of Kanoha. It was quite some distance away from the compounds of the other great clans of Kanoha. At that moment, Hataki Sakumo left his house. He seemed to be in a hurry. Araki and Kushina noticed that he looked quite frightened as he immediately took off in the direction of Hokage's office. Araki didn't overthink about it. He said to Kushina, let's go to his house and wait for him. All right. Kushina readily agreed to his idea and started walking towards the house. After they were right out of the house, they knocked on the door and called out, Hello, is someone here? Soon enough, the two heard a pleasant voice from inside the house, Yes, is there something you need? A brown-haired woman with some face marks on her face appeared in front of them. She stared at Araki and Kushina and looked quite confused. She had never seen these two kids here before. Hello, Mississippi. I am Senju Araki. And I am Uzumaki Kushina. The woman's eyes widened a little when she heard that this young boy was Senju Araki. As a member of the Inazuka clan, she was aware of who Senju Araki was. Even though he was young in terms of age, he was still one of the most influential persons in Kanoha. She had also heard rumors of how a would release bloodline user had dealt massive damage to the three great villages army. Why would the clan head of the Senju clan come here? She asked while staring at Senju Araki's face. I wouldn't hide it from you. I came here to meet Hitaki Sakumo. But I saw that he had just left the house in a hurry, so we were planning to wait for him here. Is that acceptable? He asked with a neutral look on his face. The woman thought for some time before nodding her head, All right, please come in. Don't mind our small house. Araki gave her a smile in return and said, Don't worry, until the age of seven, I lived in a shack. I am still somewhat uncomfortable in Senju clan manner. Your house gives me a feeling as if I am home. These were his honest thoughts. Kushina added, I also don't mind it. The two walked inside the guest room. The woman left the guest room and brought tea for the two of them. The two started drinking tea, and Kushina looked at the woman before asking her, where did Hitaki Sakumo go? The third Hokage ordered him to give him a detailed report in the early morning. But, Sakumo was far too tired and woke up late. 
He went to the Hokage office without even having his breakfast because he is afraid that the Hokage would scold him for being late. The woman said while smiling at them. She was a little embarrassed while telling them about her husband's lateness. It certainly didn't give a good impression. Araki frowned at that moment. Although he knew that this man had certain privileges, he didn't think that this man was so loyal to the Hokage. Can I ask why you wanted to meet Tsukumo? She asked with an interested look in her eyes. Thinking for some moments, Araki replied to her, We both wish to become his apprentices. We wanted to be trained by him and wanted to ask what his requirements would be to train us. You want to be Sakumo's apprentices? Why so? She asked them eagerly. Because of certain reasons, we do not wish to become Kanoha's shinobi. However, we still want to learn some skills from someone we can call a teacher. I believe that Hataki Sakumo was the most appropriate man for this. Araki answered her truthfully. Aren't you the Senju clan head? Why do you not want to become a shinobi of Kanoha? I dislike the way the current Hokage runs things. To him, I am no more than a tool. The thought of serving him sickens me greatly. That is why I at least want to be trained by someone who I hold in high regard. Araki said with a small smile on his face. I am sure Sakumo would be delighted to know that you trusted him to train the two of you. But, there is a low chance he would be willing to teach you. He is rarely free from his missions, after all. From her tone, Araki got the feeling that the Hokage kept Tsukumo so busy that he wasn't able to spend enough time with his wife. Well, it was natural for anyone to use a shinobi of his caliber. I promise we won't take up too much of his time. Just a few instructions and then he can leave us to figure out on our own. Actually, I wanted to start my elemental training. I have realized that my chakra training has seemingly encountered a bottleneck. Though there are many exercises in the books, I feel like someone's instruction would be more valuable. He stated quite calmly. The woman's eyes narrowed at that moment as she said, Are you sure you only want him to give you some instructions? What about asking him to stay by your side while you train? Shaking his head negatively, Araki answered, That would mean our talent is not sufficient, and we aren't qualified to receive instructions from Kanoha's white fang. And what of the payment? Sakumo won't teach you for free, you know. The woman's eyes seemed to be twinkling while staring at Araki. My elder sister Tsunade and I have inherited half of the Senju clan's property, but I am the current head of the Senju clan. I have quite a few forests I can give him for free. He nonchalantly stated which made the woman's eyes twinkle with excitement. She immediately closed the distance between them and held his hand, we have a deal. Huh? Araki showed off a confused expression. What did this woman mean they had a deal? Could she make a decision in place of Hataki Sakumo? That shouldn't be possible, right? Well, these would be his thoughts until he would hear this woman lecturing Hataki Sakumo into accepting Araki and Kushina as his apprentices. Hataki Sakumo thought of himself as a simple man. Just a little more powerful and skilled than others. He never bothered with training someone since he felt like he wasn't meant to give instructions to someone. Many times he had given suggestions to his friends. The suggestions which would get rejected by their reasoning, don't think that we are as talented as you. Give us instructions so that even normal people like us can do it. He had no idea how to give them instructions. He had always found many things extremely easy. How could he think of them from the perspective of an ordinary person or an ordinary shinobi? So, Hataki Sakumo never bothered to have students. Yet, after he returned home, he was surprised to see two young kids in his house. They were entirely unfamiliar to him. He then stared at his wife, who was looking at him with a mischievous glint. Oh damn. He hated that glint in her eyes. She would have that glint when she was about to throw him into a trap with a smile on her face. The two went to their own personal room before his wife told him about what she had talked with Araki and Kushina. Knowing that it was the Senju clan head and the Uzumaki clan member wanting to receive training from him, Hataki Sakumo couldn't help but feel a little happy. However, he still remained adamant and planned on turning them down. At that moment, his wife held his hand and started debating with him that he should accept them as his apprentice. She even gave him multiple reasons to accept them. Firstly, he wouldn't need to stay there and monitor them while they were training, giving them instructions was fine. Secondly, they could receive a vast sum of money from this. Thirdly, she said it would be an excellent chance to form relations with the Senju clan head. 
In the future, if they ever need his help, he wouldn't turn them away, right? Hataki Sakumo was not entirely convinced, but he was also not very against it now. He did believe his wife was right in this regard. It wouldn't hurt to form good relations with Senju clan head and maybe get a lot of money in return. It might help in the future? Anyway, with this, Hataki Sakumo had made up his mind over training these two children. Currently, they were standing in the middle of a training ground. It was generally used by Team 10, but it was out on a mission so Hataki Sakumo felt like it wouldn't be an issue if they used it today. The first thing he asked the two was, how good is your chakra control? Araki thought for some moments before replying, I can barely do the kunai balancing exercise with my chakra. I can do the water walking exercise, databane. Kushina said a little excitedly. She didn't even notice it when her verbal tick slipped out of her mouth. Sakumo blankly stared at her for some seconds before he started chuckling. Even Kushina realized that her verbal tick slipped out and was embarrassed. Sakumo then said to them, this is quite good for your age. But, before we start, I want to ask you the reason why you don't want to become Konoha's shinobi. Depending on the reason, I might not teach you no matter how much you pay me. Araki blankly stared at Hitaki Sakumo before facing Kushina, he gave her a silent nod and said, all right, I will tell you of our reason. Frankly speaking, I am quite disgusted at the mere thought of serving Konoha. Their actions have been nothing but hypocritical and seem to mock the efforts of my grandfather. Taking the orders from the third Hokage would be a humiliation. Hataki Sakumo's eyes widened when he heard Araki's tone, which was filled with disgust and hate for the third Hokage. He was curious about the reason why Araki would hate the third Hokage. Hataki Sakumo, I am sure you have heard of the news about Yuzushio's destruction. Naturally, Hataki Sakumo was aware of it. He knew that this village was Konoha's greatest ally. He even wanted to take a few thousand shinobi from the battlefield and to go and assist Yuzushio. However, the Hokage ordered him to stay put. The Hokage gave the reason that he didn't want his shinobi to put their life on the line for Yuzushio. He also mentioned that Yuzushio was beyond saving, so Sakumo must not think about it too much. At that time, Sakumo did believe his words and didn't overthink about it. And sometime later, another small-scale battle broke out on the borders, and he was busy with those matters again. It had been quite some time since someone mentioned the Yuzushio's destruction to him. Araki, though wasn't finished speaking, he continued with a grave tone, maybe you aren't aware of it but do you know, there are special seals placed around Yuzushio to misdirect someone and prevent them from reaching the island? Only a few people in the world were aware of the secret passage between the seals. And, I highly suspect that it was Kanoha who gave the passage to the three great villages. This. Do you have evidence about this claim? Hataki Sakumo naturally wouldn't believe the words from Araki's mouth. Araki shook his head and replied, currently I don't. But, I do not need evidence to remain cautious of Kanoha, do I? Do you find my reason acceptable now? Hataki Sakumo thought for some time before nodding, all right. If this is your reason, then it's all the more reason for me to not leave you alone. At the very least, I will make sure you don't harm Kanoha. Araki and Kushina nod their heads. Currently, even though they knew of Kanoha's treacherous deeds, they weren't planning on doing anything against them, for now, that is. We have chosen to become your apprentice not only because you are a strong ninja, but also you are someone who gives more importance to righteousness and comradeship. Araki solemnly spoke to Hataki Sakumo. Heh, thanks. But, since you are cautious of Kanoha, don't become too attached to me. At the end of the day, I am Kanoha's shinobi. There are some orders I cannot defy. Hataki Sakumo had a smile on his face before his gaze slowly turned serious. All right, enough talk now. Let's start your training. With that, Araki and Kushina's training with Hataki Sakumo started. Kurama let out a yawn as he stared at the scene from Kushina's mindscape. He wanted Araki to grow strong quickly so he could leave this damn place for good. Though, Kushina's mindscape had seemingly improved from before. Araki would enter the mindscape and use his chakra to grow a few trees for Kurama. However, these trees were created from Araki's chakra, which seemed to restrain Kurama's chakra. Meaning they weren't as good as the real trees. And just like that, for years passed by in the blink of an eye. In these next four years, Kushina and Araki mainly focused on training. Occasionally, Araki would go to some villages near Kanoha, 
where he would ask the Uzumaki clan members to go to the Land of Waves. Right now, 200 or so members of the Uzumaki clan lived in the Senju clan manor while the 1800 or so Uzumaki clan members lived in the Land of Waves under the family name Samazaki. The Uzumaki clan members living in the Senju clan manor had been given the surname of Senju. When the Hokage had asked about the reason, Araki indifferently stated that he was going to be adopting them into the Senju clan. The Hokage was curious about these people who had been adopted into the Senju clan. However, he couldn't investigate them without a good reason. After all, even the head of the village couldn't interfere with the respective clan matters. The Uchiha clan had also started to express their support for the Senju clan in the meetings, so it was next to impossible for Hokage to make his move against the Senju clan manor. However, Danzo wasn't like the third Hokage. He didn't dare to make his move against the Senju clan for an entire year, but, after the passage of that one year, he did send some of his shinobi to kidnap the Senju clan members because he felt that they were quite weird. A chakra sensor under him had informed him that all these Senju clan members seemed to possess immense chakra. Moreover, it still showed incredible signs of growth. He remained cautious as he always sent his shinobi when he knew that Araki and Kushina weren't in the village. However, many of his shinobi he sent to the Senju clan manor to kidnap some of these Senju clan never returned. The ones who did return informed him of what occurred. Every time they stepped inside the Senju clan's property, the land beneath them would explode, injuring a lot of shinobi. These were like landmines which were placed quite strategically. Sometimes, the shinobi would fall into some sort of pit and were able to get out because they didn't have the power to break the seal or knew the seal combination. These shinobi died by starvation in these pits. Kunai, shuriken, and all sorts of traps were placed. It was like, they were expecting a lot of intruders to attack them. Danzo had a headache as he couldn't understand how Araki could find such talented shinobi who could even keep of the village's ANBU forces. Many of the ANBU died before they even realized anything. The only ANBU members who survived were the ones who remained cautious and wanted to take action before looking at the entire situation first. Danzo now understood something else? This new Senju clan head had no mercy for Konoha. All his traps were designed to kill any intruders with no hint of mercy. Probably, even if the Hokage himself went to ask for the lives of these ANBU members, Araki would still deny him with a decisive tone. Even the Hokage was aware that many of his ANBU members died while infiltrating the Senju clan manor. However, he never raised this issue since he was aware that all the other clan heads would be in support of Senju clan's response. Moreover, the Senju clan was one of the founding clans of the village. Trying to infiltrate them was indeed deserving of death. But, this didn't mean he didn't hold any resentment over this fact. Another thing which angered him was how Kushina and Araki seemed to have avoided the academy entirely. They weren't even bothering to train in Konoha's academy to become Konoha's shinobi. Instead, they had become the apprentice of Hataki Sukumo. The Hokage knew of Hataki Sukumo's loyalty to Konoha and he was also aware of his strength. For these two reasons, he was unwilling to make any move against his apprentices. He knew that the man might be humble and loyal, but if he does cross his bottom line, then there was no saving it. The Uchiha clan also seemed to hold quarterly competitions between Araki and some of the most talented Uchiha clan members. The only one who seemed to give Araki a challenge was the young boy named Uchiha Kashiro. Araki was growing strong at a demonic speed, but the same was true for Uchiha Kashiro. Uchiha Kashiro now needed to use his Sharingan to keep up with Araki. Meanwhile, Araki had slowly started to use more of his wood techniques in his fight against him. Currently, the results of their fight were slightly tilted towards Araki's favor. It was 7 6 with Araki winning 7 of them and Uchiha Kashiro winning 6 of them. Although they used quite some exquisite techniques against each other, they never fought with their full power. Winning or losing didn't seem to be their motive anymore. Instead, they were aiming for something more. And whether it was consciously or unconsciously, Senju Araki and Uchiha Kashiro were aiming for the same time. The news of how Senju Araki was fighting against the Uchiha clan members spread in the Konoha, almost all the residents had heard of the stories of legendary battles between Senju Hashirama and Uchiha Madara. They felt slightly regretful that they weren't born in that era to witness the fights between the Senju and the Uchiha. 
However, now that they heard of the fight going on between Senju clan descendant and Uchiha clan descendants, they couldn't help but feel excited. Now, whenever the fight between Araki and some Uchiha clan descendants would occur, the people would rush towards the Uchiha clan district to see the fight. There, not only did they witness a fantastic fight, the people also started to talk with the Uchiha clan members in the audience. They started to realize that although arrogant, the Uchiha clan members weren't bad people. In this manner, the reputation of the Uchiha clan among the people had started improving. Uchiha Kazuma was already satisfied with his gains. Now only have the Uchihas actively started their training, their reputation within the village was also improving. Moreover he was also selling important information to Araki at a high rate. So, life was going good for him. However, this was not all that occurred in these four years. A new member had also joined Hataki Sakumo's family. It was his child by the name of Hataki Kakashi. Currently, Hataki Kakashi was only two years old. He had the same silvery hair as his father. Araki and Kushina would sometimes play with him. They would take him up on trees or show him some great sights. Poor Sakumo had to run after Araki and Kushina to ensure that Kakashi remained safe or else, his wife would definitely create a few bumps on his head. Jiraiya had also returned to Kanoha. He had even taken up an apprentice by the name of Namikaze Minato. Araki did hear of Minato's name a few times, as it seemed as if he was jumping the ranks quite quickly. He was already a chunin ranked shinobi right now. He had no idea about what Orochimaru was doing, and frankly speaking, Araki wasn't that interested in the snake. And the information from the Uchiha, he had the idea of where his elder sister, Senju Tsunade, was roaming. It seemed that she was in a city near the capital of the Land of Fire. The name of the city was Fujigata. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.